Um, welcome everyone. This is the uh, Tuesday, September 5th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, we uh, have already uh, called the meeting to order. We did have an executive session at 6 o'clock. Um, we're entering regular session now. Um, first item on the agenda is announcements and we are uh, pleased to have Antioch College President Tom Manley here to uh, give us an update on what's happening at Antioch College. Awesome. It's, it, that's, that's your cue. So I'm the announcement. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I thought I would start by, um, by telling you something that probably you already know. I've been here a year and a half, and uh, I want to tell you that this is really a pretty extraordinary place. And I mean by that not only Antioch College but the entire setting that Antioch College has grown up in. Uh, that would be the uh, village of Yellow Springs and the surrounding um, uh, township. And I say that because after 40, almost 40 years in higher education, and you can figure out when I started, but I started very young, um, <laughs> I have found that the relationship of small colleges to the communities that they, um, that they live in is often uh, a, a complicated and sometimes fraught and one-sided relationship. Um, I have not found, uh, the, our relationship is complicated. Um, that's the nature of the universe. Uh, but it is not largely fraught. Uh, people disagree. They have different opinions. Read the Yellow Spring News. There was a really interesting letter in the last edition about um, our scrawny chickens and our uh, weed-strewn uh, solar field. But I think if you look, look past um, uh, just criticism that people will have, what I found and others that come to Antioch and are able to look at the relationship with Yellow Springs is a, um, uh, a, sim a symbiosis that actually um, creates a richer potential for both. Uh, Antioch is the only true, as far as I know, this is an accurate statement. Um, you can tell me later off uh, camera and off uh, mic if, uh, if I'm wrong. But it is the only startup college in the country. And I'm raising this because I think as you sort of uh, roll out or see statistics roll out about solar fields and uh, not very many students uh, and uh, financial struggles, you need to put those in the context of what's actually happening in Yellow Springs now and what was happening in Yellow Springs 167 years ago when, uh, when Antioch was uh, sited here and then when Horace Mann showed up in 1852 or 1853. And that was an experiment in American higher education. And that experiment has continued low these 160 some years, and it's continuing now on the Antioch campus. So today I had an amazing conversation with one of our faculty members who just came up after our community meeting, community meeting, which has been happening at Antioch for many, many years. It's run by students. Um, it, the agenda is set by students. It's, uh, uh, but it is the governance of the community. That's a gift. Uh, it's a form of small community democracy that uh, I haven't seen at any of the four or five other colleges that I've worked at. And even the colleges that style themselves as extremely progressive, Hampshire, Evergreen, and Pitzer, where I did work for a long time, don't have anything that's, that's that equivalent, where students are really engaged in the governance of the college as if it's a laboratory for them to learn about participatory democracy. So after that meeting, a faculty member came up and told me about a course that he was teaching this quarter, this summer quarter, with four students where they are designing and building a course for, for the next quarter for a, a more expanded class. But the students are participating in the construction of this class and they're doing it in a way that is part of their education that will be part of the education of other students. This kind of experimentation uh, doesn't happen as a regular course. And it's happening in Yellow Springs where you already have a fairly uh, progressive uh, uh, school system. So I want to 
to contextualize um, all of the the, um, the stats, the uh, the information that we pick up about how Antioch is doing, uh, in the sense of being true to its experiment, we're doing we're doing really well. Uh, every day deals us some um, new challenges. Today, we um, um, uh, last week we woke up to posters. Uh, from um, uh, a group that uh, has extremist views uh, that made many of us in Yellow Springs and including many of our students and especially our students of color uh, or um, uh, LGBTQ uh, identities uncomfortable um, with, with their safety. So we've been dealing with that. Today we didn't wake up but at, uh, earlier this morning we heard from the Attorney General that the Trump administration is no longer going to support the, um, the Dreamers program, which means that a number of the students who go to Antioch are now um, um, uncertain about their future, about their welcome uh, in, in, in the country. Those are things that colleges everywhere are dealing with. We have to deal with them at Antioch, but we have to deal with them as a, uh, as I said, a, um, a forward-thinking progressive uh, institution. Our uh, uh, enrollment numbers for this uh, uh, fall uh, quarter are going to be small. Um, uh, right now we're hoping to get a class of 30 students. Uh, that um, is not on par with where we would like to be, but on the other hand, we are moving from a, a school that's completely uh, tuition free to a school that's actually beginning to charge some tuition and asking students to invest uh, financially in their education. And I will say that uh, of all of the student um, uh, student applications and accept, uh, uh, those that have been accepted, there are some really exceptional uh, young people, um, people who will uh, not only change our college and our village, but uh, change the world. Our um, support from our alumni, which is another incredible story in America, 85% uh, of all of the bills that, that, that are paid at, uh, at Antioch are paid by uh, supporters of the college um, and alumni. We raised, uh, um, last year we raised uh, between 12 and $13 million and most of that was, uh, well all of that was in, in, in donations. If you take a, a college of uh, 10 or 20 times our size in many state universities, you won't find them raising that much money. Um, in the entire year, and we're doing it from um, from students who've gone to uh, from a few thousand people who have attended Antioch over the years. So I'm very encouraged. Uh, every morning uh, I, I get up and um, and uh, spend some time appreciating uh, where I am, uh, and um, and you know I probably spend part of the day also um, uh, muttering under my breath. Uh, about having time to actually work on the more exciting educational pieces and not having to stop and write a letter to the community or to the alumni about how we'll respond to the, uh, the larger context in which we find ourselves living uh, in, in, in our country and in our world. I don't know if there's a Q&A section of this. Uh, at Antioch, I've come to know Q&A is quarrel and argue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I expect some time out and a, uh, you know, a break. Well, we appreciate you being here. Um, and on, in all regards, and you mentioned the, the situation that happened last week. Um, <clears throat> I, I know the Yellow Springs Police has been in, have been involved, and yes. um, I, I called um, to make sure that that was happening. I, I reached out to make sure that was happening, and and I want you to know that th that all of council certainly supports that. Anything that we can do, I mean, we're we consider Antioch um, an absolutely vital element to this community, and anything that we can do to help, um, we want to have the conversation, and everything we can do to help, you know, in we can't directly help with enrollment, but you know, if we we can all we can always talk about what a great place this is. We can always model what a great place this is, and 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 talk about the values of the community, which we think will help to attract students. Well, we we feel um, uh, supported um, um, by all of the um, 
uh, institutions in Yellow Springs, from the fire department to the police department. Uh, these are complex, again, I use the word a lot, but these are these really are complex times for us, and uh, um, we value this, this relationship. Uh, I don't think you can take Antioch out of Yellow Springs and vice versa, so, um, you know, we, we appreciate that, and um, uh, and, and particularly particularly the uh, the support around um, whatever threats there are to our community. Yeah. Council, other council yeah. members. I was going to say, um, my name is Judith Hempling. I don't think we met. Hello. Um, you're the you're the last person actually in Yellow Springs I haven't met. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to let you know. Um, Brian Hausch and I have been talking about the, uh, the, the white supremacist posters that came up on, uh, on the campus and have uh, reached out to some of the community groups about the idea of a uh, community-wide uh, nonviolent training uh, that we come together as a community to be prepared and to further our anti-racist you know, commitments um, and our, our uh, you know, our strong commitment to inclusivity of our community. So um, we reached out to Quaker Meeting, uh, the 365 group, and village we're going mediation. to be, yeah, village mediation, um, and uh, are looking to, you know, help. We're not going to organize it, but we wanted to put the call out that the community uh, you know, to try to help that to happen, and there's already been positive response, and so, um, just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, also, I'm sure you're aware of House Bill 179 of the, the state legislature, uh, which has to do with punishing sanctuary cities, um, punishing public officials who, um, you know, defend uh, immigrants. And uh, just to say, just, just making, uh, wanted to make, uh, have our community be aware of what's happening in this state, what potentially could happen, uh, and what that could mean for our community. So I, it's important that people start looking at that. I think if the paper could start you know, drawing the community's attention to it, uh, it could be a real challenge given our commitment, uh, our commitments, our values as a community. So, yeah. Yeah, well, well thank you. And I think the more that we can do together and, ha and show uh, solidarity and presence. Uh, the, the campus, with, with especially in the summer with uh, our smallest numbers, um, can feel like a, uh, uh, an isolated place. And so um, people who are actively showing their um, uh, support for um, uh, uh, diversity and inclusion and uh, opposition to, I think, views that kind of close off um, uh, those possibilities uh, and 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 um, signal out particular groups and identities um, that that's really important you know we're worried uh, about repercussions from the federal government uh, less so from the state government about stands that we take uh, we are accredited but we don't have status to uh, uh, admit international students at this point. Um, we, the, the federal government has actually shown its willingness to, with the um, sanctuary cities, to actually threaten funding. Um, uh, that for colleges and universities is lifeblood in terms of uh, uh, federal financial aid uh, support. But I think it's I think we've we've decided that while we don't want to make statements that we cannot uh, that may not mean anything, like being a sanctuary campus, um, we're not sure that that actually has any um, uh, actionable um, meaning, and it might actually lead people to think that they're protected in ways that we can't protect them. Um, that notwithstanding, we think it's really important for us to, uh, to hold moral ground on these issues, and so if there are repercussions um, and are protecting students and doing things within the wall to make sure that they feel safe, then we're, we're going to have to um, accept those, those consequences. Mm -hmm. So we, we appreciate the support and from, the, uh, from the community and 
Uh, and I'd, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, Yellow Springs is small, Antioch is even smaller, but it's very easy to, well, as you were saying, be sort of isolated. So I think the more you and other people can come from Antioch and talk about what's going on, people from the village come to the community meetings, um, the more we know what's going on, the better. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm happy to come anytime. And Yellow Springs is small, Antioch is smaller, but they you know, they sit on big ideas and big visions, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Tom, I just wanted to say I've appreciated that uh, you've reached out and that we've been able to have communications and sort of underscoring what Mary Ann said. The more open those channels can be, I think the, uh, the better for all of us, so. Good. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks thank all, uh, so to much. all of you, right. Thanks. thanks. Okay. Um, I know that this, it, it's, it isn't really an announcement, but we wanted, we figured you'd want to get in and get out quickly, so that's why we put it under announcements. So I have a couple of others um, I'd like to pull out of petitions and communications. One is the, um, the trail survey, the, the announcement from uh, MBRPC about the trail survey. Um, this letter is more about that there's going to be an online survey, but they're actually going to be doing actual trail counts on September 13th and 16th. And those will happen at Yellow Springs Station. Um, I'm helping to coordinate it. So from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Wednesday, September 13th and Saturday, September 16th, I need volunteers. We, we are breaking it up into two-hour segments, and so it would be good to have at least two volunteers. Probably on Saturday we may need a few more. Um, I already have some, but it would be nice to have a few more. So if anybody's interested, uh, just give me a call at the Chamber office. Um, and then the elected officials uh, symposium, um, that is October 27th at, uh, over at Swine Medical Center. It's being coordinated by um, Dan Kirkpatrick, who is the um, mayor of Fairborn. So it's primarily for elected officials, but I assume that other, other folks are, are included. Um, you know, law enforcement, if, if somebody from, from council wanted to go, that would be good. I can, um, the flyer was in and I think all of the necessary information is there. I'm assuming I'll get more information. And um, it's a 5.30 to 8.30. 5.30 to 8.30. And I'm assuming we'll get more information, but I would like um, someone from Yellow Springs to be there. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, candidates uh, should consider going as well True, yeah. to uh, get informed about the, uh, the, pro uh, the crisis. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, I just want I just wanted to uh, add on to what I said about the um, this nonviolent interface, uh, maybe uh, both religious institutions and uh, public institutions. Um, anyway, there's a beginning interest in doing this, and I wanted to ask if uh, so. The Quaker meeting is kind of looking at uh, a role to play and. Uh, I was talking to Brian about how do we help different groups come together. Uh, we're not going to do the training. We're not going to be directly involved. I don't think council is going to do that. But um, to help these, this idea kind of come together. And I wondered if we could ask maybe Judy to be, uh, uh, you know, a person that could be contacted if there's different um, of our, you know, community groups that are interested in participating in, in such a, in such a you know, uh, training uh, and that we could pass it on to the Quaker meeting, to the um, to the uh, mediation group, and 365, the the groups that might take the lead on this. Judy, is that okay? Can you be a clearinghouse? I know uh, what I'm doing with those people who call. I yes. think I think it's kind of keeping track of who's interested in yeah. the effort, and then and then we'll check in and make sure it gets passed on to. I also, I mean, I, I also wonder if, if you, we can just ask John Gudgel to do it as we, uh, Brian's talked to he, John. He's and definitely, yeah, I mean, village mediation is, is interested. I mean, I, I think what we all recognize is that Yellow Springs is, you know, the ideal target, not only because, uh, you know, these groups are expecting a, a reaction, but also because we get a lot of press. And, um, you know, I think part of this initiative that Judith's, you know, talking about and that we want to think about is, is 
tactics for not reacting, uh, not getting violent, and ultimately, you know, creating something that's even worse. And um, you know, what I hope is that we can come up with a community agreement that um, is both effective and is resisting in a way that that fits our village values. I think that's good. I think that we, I think we actually have weathered some some. Uh, there have been some opportunities for for people to to come and protest that actually haven't happened. Um, when we have we've had pride for six or seven years now, a m large celebration. We haven't had any problems with that. I think we've had a, we, we actually um, do seem to have a little bit of of. Um, uh, I don't. Know, I, th I think that maybe we're so strong in our convictions that people say, "Hey, there's nobody. You know, there's no reason to go there to try to change minds." Um, so I'm hoping, and, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I and I think I think we need to be prepared and based upon some of the things I'm seeing in social media, the whole issue of nonviolence and and how to approach the situation is absolutely critical because that's not the way everyone is thinking right now. Um, and so I think that we need to do that. So I appreciate that. So at this point, we're asking Judy to so, just yeah, just track if, uh, names people and hear the interest. call. They can just you know if it's uh, you know yep. churches, uh, other organizations of the village who want to participate in something. Yeah, you can just hold the list. If so, Judy Kittner, the, the clerk of council, uh, could hold a list of of interested people. Then um, we'll we'll make sure Brian and I that it gets to the appropriate folks. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll mention a few other uh, sort of traditional announcements. Um, this Saturday is the 9-11 stair climb at Antioch College. Um, so I'd strongly encourage people to support that uh, important event. Uh, on Sunday, the 10th, there are competing events. WISO is having its community concert down at Riverscape. And um, the Glen, Helen, is having its uh, Who Cooks For You event. Um, Next Friday uh, is the TLT auction, which uh, the village is a, a sponsor of, and uh, that's always loads of fun, as Krista will tell you. And um, I did want to mention that uh, since we won't have a meeting until the 18th, that September 16th is the next tour being hosted by the 365 Project. This is uh, blacks in residential areas, uh, and, and also I know the uh, young people of color are involved in that initiative. And um, September 15th, the Senior <laughs> Center is having their dementia-friendly Yellow Springs, I believe, kind of kickoff at 8.30. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did want to uh, highlight that the Economic Sustainability Commission, which meets tomorrow, will be meeting at 5 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock. Um, uh, and I know that's been announced, but just in case anyone was thinking about that meeting. And uh, I think that is it. What was the time again for the senior citizen? Uh, it starts at 8.30. Um, oh, yes, and I did want to mention, and I know we have something in the packet about this, but um, Village Mediation is celebrating 30 years, and that celebration is happening on September 14th at 7 p.m. Great. Thanks, Brian. Anybody else have anything? Okay. I have one. Oh, go ahead. Um, the infrastructure that Majors Enterprises is putting in um, from East Eden Road um, to the west on Dayton Yellow Springs. On Monday and Tuesday, we will be slow charging the water line. We do not think this is going to cause any brown water. It might. We will be putting out notices. We don't think that is going to cause brown water. What will definitely cause brown water next week is when we flush that hydrant on Thursday. And we will be putting these notices out. Staff is meeting at actually at 8 o'clock in the morning to work on the notices so that we can get them out to everyone. Um, again, we don't think there will be brown water on Monday and Tuesday, but there will definitely be brown water on <coughs> Thursday. And we will put that out um, so that everybody can be prepared for that. OK, thanks, Patty. Um, I do have one more thing to mention. Um, there is a chamber chat on uh, dis on September 21st at eight o or nine o'clock in the morning here. Um, it's about business insurance, and breakfast will be served thanks to Reichley Insurance. Um, 
Next is the consent agenda. It's a big one because we've bundled, usually the consent agenda is just the minutes and financial reports, but we've actually bundled some, um, how many ordinances, six ordinances that are part of the pocket neighborhood uh, development that are basically just small text amendments and, and not of substance. So for at least just for this first reading, we're bundling them. Um, so I will. Um, um, actually, can we pull out 2017-18? So it's the second on the list. Sure. <clears throat> what are we doing with it? Uh, we want to just do so. We're going to add. Are we going to add that to yeah, to the we, other? Okay, to the regular discussion to be had. Just a minor. Thing. Okay. Okay. So we'll pull that one out and add it to the legislation. So then that would be um, five text or five ordinances that are included just for the first reading. Can I get a motion to accept? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. I like this. I like this consent agenda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and again, a reminder that we're doing this because these are just definitional uh, additions, nothing substantive. And, and the next meeting, though, yes, I, I, yeah, that. right. Yes. They, when we have the second reading, we will have the full reading, and we'll have public comment allowed on every one of them, not um, <clears throat> not just the ones that are currently in legislation. Uh, petitions and communications, will you review those, Brian? Please? Do we need to review the agenda? Oh, sorry, review of the agenda. Um, anything we want to add? We just added one of the, one of the uh, ordinances. Can we, I guess just again, briefly add complete streets? Because I do have some new dates if we want to have that community forum. Okay, old business complete streets, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? <clears throat> okay, now re review the petitions and communications. Okay. Uh, so we received a letter from Eric Clark about the lodging tax, which uh, he noted he thought was fine, but there are some issues related to uh, casual users and some other things, which actually uh, Melissa is going to address later in the meeting. Um, uh, I also included a two-page document from the Department of Business Services, that's one of our state agencies, about uh, TIFs, uh, tax increment financing, mostly because I wanted to make sure everybody understood that you know TIF is not a grant program, but what it basically is is uh, taking uh, future tax revenues, putting it into a fund, um, for spending on infrastructure. Um, ultimately, what this means is uh, tax revenues are shifted away from the schools. There's a lots of uh, pros and cons out there about this, but it is the kind of thing that councils do not go into lightly. Not only are there legal costs, but there are a lot of other things involved. Um, the uh, Green County Public Health uh, sent us two things. One about uh, West Nile, which was mentioned before, and some tips about avoiding mosquitoes. There was one case uh, that's been uh, identified, and in, in it was a resident of Xenia. Um, also, uh, oh yeah, I should have mentioned, uh, today is Protect Your Groundwater Day. Uh, that's September 5th, it was just named. And uh, Green County is uh, celebrating that as well as having a well testing event where you can go to the Green County Fairgrounds on September 28th and have your well water tested. So you can bring a sample and they'll check out the lead and other things uh, with that. Um, and I think we talked about the other, Karen already talked about the other uh, um, petitions and communications, so. Okay, uh, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, we have the second reading and public hearing of ordinance 2017-14. If you wanna <coughs> read this in by title only, and I guess I will be recusing myself, and um, but I will stay in the audience reserving my right to speak. And I am as well. Okay. All right. Okay. This is Ordinance 2017-14, enacting new Chapter 882 entitled Lodging Excise Tax of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, effective January 1, 2018. Okay, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. 
Um, uh, so I will just briefly highlight, this has been a, a topic of discussion for an uh, extensive period of time now. Um, what we are proposing is uh, a 3 percent lodging tax, which is typical of about 80 percent of the municipalities across the state. Um, we've done a lot of research about uh, the ins and outs and the process of how this works and ultimately decided that the fairest uh, approach would be to apply the lodging tax to uh, all transient guests uh, lodging establishments. So whether you have one room or more, um, that it, it will apply across the board. Um, Eric Clark's letter, which uh, I referenced before, did raise some interesting points, and, and we've said that the process piece of this is something that we need to work on as we understand a little bit better, uh, but in terms of the substantive uh, piece of the legislation, uh, that was read um, at our last meeting. So with that, I think, Chris, were you going to say a few words about the process and then Melissa, or vice versa? Okay, so Melissa. Okay, um, so after kind of reviewing some of the commentary and um, suggestions um, and feedback that were brought um, before council and outside of council on the lodging t uh, tax legislation, um, I'm going to make sure that I'm working from, um, I know that my copy is the marked up copy, but I wasn't sure if the pages kind of changed. No, it hasn't. Okay. So um, what I would like to do is I would like to recommend two changes to the current, current ordinance in front of everyone. The first change would be on page two of the ordinance under um, section 882.03, which is exemptions. I would like to add a number three, which would read rents received by a lodging establishment that only furnishes lodging to transient guests for five nights or less per year. So basically what um, this request is, is to add an exemption which states that if anyone um, is operating um, as a lodging establishment on an occasional basis, which we determined um, five nights or less per year would be um, a good number um, to make that re recommendation to council, that they would be exempt from having to uh, report and remit any tax to the village. We know that there are a lot of uh, individuals that open up their homes um, to different organizations and such throughout throughout the year, and it's more for uh, hospitality reasons versus the operation of a business. So, we would like I would like to uh, recommend that that change be added onto page two. If council would like to consider, I'd like that. to make a motion that we make that edit to the legislation. Second. And the uh, second. Should we should we oh. vote on that? Should we vote on that for, or should we? Yeah, discuss I guess we it? should. Uh, so, all those in favor of that amendment signify by saying aye. All right. Aye. And the second and final change that I would like to, or edit that I would like to propose, would be to section 882.05, tax to be separately stated and charged. The first paragraph, just adding the two words when possible. Um, so basically, I know that there were some concerns about a particular um, website that people are using to advertise and book um, their lodging establishments. And this paragraph basically says that um, any of the um, receipts or invoices that are given to the customers that the lodging tax needs to be separately stated and sometimes that's not possible um, with certain um, certain websites and such that are used, so we would like to add the, the two words when possible. After uh, they're over. Um, it would be the first, the first two words of that paragraph would okay. be when possible, the tax to be collected, okay. and so on. So I have a question. Um, does that mean there's still a responsibility to collect it? It's, is it correct? It's just that it doesn't need to be printed on the receipt. Okay. okay. Because okay. Uh, Airbnb, for example, won't let you do that. Okay. Right. So um, I make a motion that we make that change. Uh, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that was that was all that I had in in terms of the actual ordinance and the substance of the ordinance. So I don't know if. Chris Can I ask? Wanted. Actually, let me ask you two questions. Um, okay, first of all, on reporting and remitting, because um, I think this was uh, this is eighty eight. 882.07. Um, I, I think that this was misread. Is that right? 
because this, when I looked at it again, I didn't see anything that said that you have to bring a whole stack of receipts and put them on your desk well, or anything, right? I think that that was being taken very literally. Um, I think that the actual, um, I think that the actual statement said, um, it made a reference to um, basically outlining all receipts listed, and I think that that was being taken very literally as every single receipt would need to be turned in to the finance director. And what we're looking for is a simpler version of just simply what were the receipts that were received, not individually listed. So I think that that was taken very literally, and after that was kind of pointed out to me, I reread this section, and that was my understanding of it, and certainly that was my intention, was not to receive every single receipt that somebody would take in, but rather a, a summary of all receipts. Right, and I mean, I think it's this on the third line that says, such returns shall show the receipts from furnishing lodging. And that so doesn't that just mean in total? That just means the amount, right? Correct. It's not a physical receipt. Yes. Okay. And and that is what is listed on the form. On the form. Right. Correct. Okay. And then the second thing I wanted to clarify because I just got a question about it today is the board of taxation that is referred to. Is this a state agency or what? Well, the, actual, the board of tax review. The the actual village that is one of the um, boards and commissions. Would it be considered a board and commission, Judy? Yeah. That actually um, exists. Like we had a utility dispute resolution board that kind of died on the vine, right. so to speak. And then once we had made changes with the landlord responsibility piece, that was reenacted and reestablished. Okay. So we have a board of tax appeals, which hasn't really been used because we use Rita to collect our income taxes and then the property tax mechanism would be through the county since they are the ones that collect it since the village doesn't necessarily collect any taxes on their own um, that has been relatively unused but since this would be a tax that would be can would be collected at the village level and not through a third party then we would like to to revive that uh, Ta board of Tax Appeals so that if anybody would ever have any issues that they would have a place in which to go and to voice their concerns. Okay. But, and so when I read this, so that's good to know because I didn't know that was on the books, but all this says is that you file your appeal with the finance director and the clerk of council, but this is not saying that that is who comprises the board, right? No, and I think that that is actually listed separately, which would be in perhaps the codified ordinances. I think that that's where the makeup of those boards is actually listed. Okay. I haven't looked at that to see exactly what that makeup is, um, but I know that with the Utility Dispute Resolution Board that there's an ordinance that, that says what the makeup of it is. Okay, so if we could pull that ordinance in for the mm -hmm. next meeting and, and then we can figure out what we need to do to get that staffed up. But I assume it's similar to the Dispute Resolution Board, which has citizens. And staff. And staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Those were my questions. Council, any other questions before Chris comes up? Nope. nope. Okay. Chris? Good evening, everybody. I really don't have much to add. Uh, Melissa provided a, an excellent summary. We uh, spent some time last week uh, making sure that we had addressed everything that had been brought to our attention. Uh, the, Next remaining step, uh, should council uh, adopt the uh, ordinance, would then be to um, have the text amendments addressed by the planning commission uh, because then they need to come back to make sure that our zoning code can be read consistently with the intentions of the laws of tax. So okay. in this process that we're going through, uh, that will happen uh, once planning commissions had an opportunity to look at that make it's a recommendation only council has to approve and the public will have an opportunity to comment and before planning commission and in fact before council again great all right thanks Grace. uh other questions or comments from council and i did have, i did want yes. to address um Listen. the statement that i put in the packet thanks i did put a uh, one page document in the packet that um kind of went over some of the different things that I just went over in terms of uh, reporting and things like that. But um, I also just want to put that out there that 
since my office and well I'm kind of the Lone Ranger as the finance director since I'll be the one that will be responsible for collecting and working with business operators that I my, it's not my intention to make this complicated whatsoever um, it's it's my intention is to make this as simplistic as possible and this ordinance gives everybody guidelines in terms of how this is going to work but in my office at that level I'll be able to have some flexibility in terms of uh, mechanisms such as forms or getting some sort of online mechanism for reporting and really working with uh, those business operators so my door is always open and I am more than willing to listen to suggestions and help help uh, business operators make this as easy as possible in order to report and um, I'm more than willing to work with folks and to hear them out and uh, take into consideration any suggestions that they may have. So I'm hoping that people take me up on that because I know that there's not, um, you know, a ton of people that are operating and some are larger than others. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to help as, as much as I can. So. All right. And Melissa, I appreciate it because clearly you've already shown that in responding to, I think, what were some good issues that were brought up as we figure out the process. So, um, given, given, yes. given what Chris said, having this come before planning, uh, we need to look at planning, uh, the planning commission's calendar to make sure we have enough time to look at it and then get it back to you folks before the second reading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or at least before January. Oh, yes. Yeah, Definitely. when it goes into. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so this is the second reading and the public hearing. And so I will now open the public hearing for any citizen comments. Okay, seeing and hearing. Yeah, Megan. Is this the time to ask questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I should have said questions and comments. Thank you. No, yes. Okay. Uh, Megan Bachman, Yellow Springs News. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, under the um, section of actions to collect, what kinds of actions the village would pursue and which kinds they would not in order to collect the taxes. Um, the second question I had was about, I'm just going to say my questions and go back, that's okay. The second question was about the exemptions, like in what cases would places be exempt? Are you talking about, for example, a, a nonprofit like the Glen would be uh, exempt from these and other taxes? And then finally, just with the Planning Commission's involvement, is there any intention in that regard to look at other um, ways of regulating these rather than just taxes, but looking at fire, fire code or you know, making sure there's working fire alarms, any other kinds of regulatory? Is there, is there a desire to go beyond the taxing to other levels of regulation? Um, well, I could comment on other types of regulation. I mean, I think there is going to be a, a future discussions thinking about uh, the Airbnb phenomenon uh, impacts on affordable affordability in communities that are uh, uh, destination communities. Um, sort of balancing, I mean, Airbnb kind of, those kind of, that kind of activity, it goes both ways, it cuts both ways in terms of affordability. It helps people who are having difficulty paying their, you know, bills in the village, uh, you know, to, so we're going to be looking at that. Um, I know there was a letter a couple months ago by Ellis Jacobs in the Yellow Springs News saying, we need to look at this as a community. It's not a problem now, but it could be in the future, and we need to be thinking ahead about that. So, And, and I'll just add to that, most of what we're doing is just uh, making sure that the zoning code has the, the same definition. So these are, uh, so one issue is we now have short-term rental and changing that to transient guest lodging. Um, but I think one thing we will also need to discuss is currently short-term rentals are conditional use. Um, so that would be one thing that we will look to planning council, uh, a planning commission to discuss and make a re recommendation to council. But most of the changes are definitional. Um, Chris, do you want to talk about the other? Um, I think your first question pertains to enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the enforcement piece is, is similar to what one would see in, in zoning codes. Um, there's a process by which I would call informal dispute resolution, which is the operation of common sense. 
That means that the finance director typically has discovered that there's some anomaly that needs to be addressed, much like a utility bill. Um, if, if you think back to how zoning works, all the zoning codes have enforcement ability by the municipality. Um, it's only when a situation escalates to the most extreme example do you see that notices are made, there's an attempt to pull somebody into court, and the threat of some type of penalty in a court occurs. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you that, that can anybody even here remember the last time that happened in the village? Um, my guess is they probably can't because it's so infrequent. So again, the, the idea is, and the concept all along is that there will be informal res dispute resolution mechanisms that really just sit down and talk. Um, I just I cannot imagine that there would be an operator that would ever find themselves in a situation where they would end up in, in Xenia Municipal Court. That would just be very, very rare. And also what we learned from other municipalities is when uh, operators weren't paying, it's because they didn't know that there was a lodging tax. And so I know we're going to make every effort mm -hmm. to uh, notify, but also understand that people might not, you know, learn about this right away. And so that's part of the public piece will be the RFQ that's created and, and uh, staff is going to be working on that, that informational piece uh, that I'm anticipating there will be a link online that people can look to that and then if they have any questions just pick up the phone and, and call. Uh, and I think that you got a second question, and I don't remember exactly. Exemptions. Ex exemption. Okay. Exemptions. 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 Exemption at the local uh, level. Uh, Nonprofits. Anybody who's tax exempt by definition. So that means another the, the two entities that you mentioned would not be uh, subject to the tax. Mm -hmm. The third one I can't remember. Yeah, Chris. Chris. Okay. The the local level tax exemption I would have to look into because most nonprofits and like municipalities and and otherwise um, they have a state tax exemption and not necessarily a county or a local tax exemption. So I would have to look into that just to, to verify how that would work with us, but I believe it's only at the state level. Yeah, the Glenn's mm -hmm. Glenn the Glenn paying the county, the county tax right now. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think I think what Chris was getting at is, is there's a distinction between if you are a public official um, you can technically establish that and not pay uh, the lodging tax. So that's kind of like on the books that there are certain um, people that are exempt. Um, but I don't know of any uh, examples where, I mean, if you're operating as uh, a transient guest lodging facility, that doesn't automatically exempt you. Are you saying if us elected officials go to Columbus, we don't have to pay lodging tax? If we bring proof. You, well, yeah, and we've actually you got... You have to pay some. You have to pay some. <laughs> I that's think crazy. they can only be exempt from the local. Right? It's just the local, I think. Yeah, but we also, that's contemplated in our ordinance. Okay. That um, if there are reasons why people are exempt, mm -hmm. right. um, then they just have to, but they have to show the, you know, the person. So if they're coming to stay at a place, they have to prove that they're... Carry your certificate with you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I will look into that to understand that further. One of the little benefits, huh? Yeah, same. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments from citizens? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. And uh, Judy, could you do the roll call? Indeed. Sims? Yes. Hempling? Yes. House? Yes. You coming back? All right, yes, let's welcome Karen and Marianne back. Did you notice I actually uh, went through the proper procedure? And, uh, Okay, uh, next we've got Ordinance 2017-15. Um, let's just do everything by title only, Judy. Okay, this is 2017 Supplemental Appropriations and Declaring an Emergency for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. Uh, Melissa. Okay, so this is probably um, one of the strangest supplemental appropriations I've ever done because there's a lot of different lines, but the net... Um, overall change in the budget was actually a reduction to the tune of $9,795. Um, so everybody has in front of them um, the actual ordinance 2017-15 um, in the format in which I uh, turn over to the county. 
However, the uh, second page, the supplemental appropriation worksheet is a much easier to read and um, understand document which ties into that ordinance format document. So um, basically what I do, it, uh, this is a very regular thing that I do um, throughout the year, usually once mid-year unless something uh, comes up which requires immediate attention, but usually once mid-year and then again at the end of the year I go through everything and I take a look um, at anything that might have been overstated or if there were expenditures that were um, not necessarily something that we were expecting. So. I've got this separated out into the general fund, so I'm just going to briefly touch on these things. Um, we had some repairs, we had some legal fees outside of retainer, um, we had some hardware and software changes, um, we'd gotten some new servers and such, and some of those required, uh, some of the things that we'd done with hardware and software uh, costed a little bit more than what we were bracing for. And then there was also a uh, transfer out to the CDBG grant fund, which um, that was one of the uh, grants that we got through Greene County that was covering ramps and domes, and we thought that we were going to be fronting the money, and we were not. So that's actually a reduction. So, um, excuse me, Melissa, are yeah. you on uh, administrate the seventy thousand? Um, I'm looking at the supplemental appropriation worksheet right. under the general fund. All right. The reductions are in parentheses, so that was the one that I was just referencing, the CDBG oh, grant fund. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, the actual ordinance format is um, it's a okay. it's a little it's a little less easy to to read. Okay. So I do this worksheet, which ties into it, which is it gives a little bit more detail. It gives some descriptions and which lines are affected and such in the budget. So actually, the general fund uh, is seeing an increase in expenditures of 120,400, and then in the special revenue section, um, there was some engineering, some costs from the barn out at Sutton Farm, some maintenance and security type things. Um, the largest one, though, is uh, the largest line is actually a reduction of $109,040, which uh, was to the green space fund beginning of the year, um, actually it was done with the first supplemental appropriation, we had, uh, we had appropriated $200,000 uh, for the uh, Arnovitz property, um, bracing for anything that the village might need to commit, um, and that was a total of $200,000, and we actually didn't come uh, very close to spending that, so this is actually a reduction to cover that cost, and then there was an extra $21,000, which we're preparing for, which should be coming to council actually tonight no no the invasives um, it, it'll be coming to council as well so in the special revenue funds there was a reduction of eighty thousand two hundred and ninety five dollars overall in the capital project funds we had uh, the the glass farm solar field work which was not in the original budget but we knew um, was going to be happening we just weren't sure when it was going to be happening so there's those uh, costs in the electric capital improvement fund and again that CDBG grant fund I had a brace for that expenditure and that's a decrease of twenty six thousand dollars since the county covers that. I, can we be taking that from both from two different Yeah because funds? the general fund was transferring it out to okay. a fund that I had created where it would actually be expense. So okay. yes it's it's overstated but that's the way that I have to do it. Okay. So it is confusing. And then lastly, we have uh, our enterprise funds. Um, we had some more uh, hardware, software support, legal fees above retainer, and then the largest one, which was also a reduction, was in water treatment. The reduction was 100000 out of professional services. Um, and if everybody remembers with this new water plant, we were spending um, quite a bit in engineering, which was coming out of the professional services line. So when I budgeted for the 2017 budget, I was looking at those professional services costs that we'd had historically and I overstated that because we were finished with those engineering costs thankfully. Um, so that was a reduction overall in enterprise funds of 73900 which brings us to our bottom line which is a reduction overall of 9795 in total. Back up on water and sewer. Um, the hardware and software. I, I hope that those expenditures will be transferable or possibly for the new plant. Yeah, most of, most of these things were, uh, I, Patty, you might have to help me here. We had, uh, we'd replaced servers. 
uh, we had our new website support. Um, some of that was the uh, new utility billing software that was paid for. Um, I'm trying to think of what else came out of that, but I know that it was it was a number of different things this year that we had happen. Um, as far as the plant specifically, there is nothing that mm -mm. has been bought that will not be used in okay. the plant. Yeah, it was all mostly stuff that was in the Bryan Center, I think, wasn't okay. it, Patty? Yes. Nothing outside of this facility, though, that I remember. So that's it for my presentation on that. Comments or questions from council? This is unrelated, uh, sort of, but it's just related to the budget. Do you know off the top of your head what the local government funding is that we've gotten this year? Um, I think that it was budgeted for 92000 in receipts this year, okay. if I remember. Yeah. Have we gotten it? That sounds um, actually, I don't have the revenue report in here. Anyway, so I think... We've Maybe come real meeting. close. Well, the next meeting we'll be talking about general fund, and that's one of the receipts that comes into the general fund. So it will be discussed at the next meeting. Okay. Thanks. Thank Anything you. else? Yeah, I have a couple questions about the supplemental appropriation worksheet. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, under the general fund, it says seventy thousand for CVE engineering and housing needs. Mm hmm. Can you break that down? Yes, the housing needs assessment. The money that we were going to spend towards that would be coming out of there. Um, I don't remember what the total on that was, Patty. Around well, 30. Around I was going to say. I and then the, 48. the engineering that was discussed at the last council meeting for um, okay. for the property, that's that expenditure is being braced for as well. Okay, so those are bundled together. And Correct, mm -hmm. they're bundled okay. together. And then under capital projects, what was the 50000 for the electric capital improvement? Glass farm solar field work. So we, what did that go for? Um, part of it is um, the um, meter that we have to buy, um, and part of it is um, the Johnny has to put in the transformer. So it's our part it's of like the hooking up the solar field yes. to our system. Correct. Do exactly. we have to extend the line too? Yes, we're doing that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No. This is a first reading, but it is an emergency, so there will only be one reading. Uh, so I will open up the public hearing for comments or questions. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. <clears throat> McQueen? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Wintra? Yes. Uh, Let's just keep moving down the line. 16, 2017, 16. This is amending the official zoning map of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio for the property located on High Street, parcel ID, long lengthy number on 1.710 acres from RA Low Density Residential District to RB Moderate Density Residential District and declaring an emergency. Can I get a motion, please? Second. Okay. Um, Denise, you're here. If you want to come up and address this one. Um, the Planning Commission at their August 14th meeting did make a recommendation for approval to uh, go uh, keep that in line with the rest of the area or, which surrounds this property on two sides, which is residential B. Would you just go back and explain the need um, just briefly that it was annexed <coughs> and that it came in at a different... Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. This had been um, <clears throat> annexed into the village some years ago. It's completely surrounded by territory that's already within the village, um, but it's um, actually uh, considered Miami Township. It's not in the village. <clears throat> that being said, there was a section of it that was auctioned off, <coughs> excuse me, about a year ago. <clears throat> and um, uh, the property owner wanted to come into the village um, she's asking to to be a part of the village, and so we went through the she went through the annexation process. Um, there still is a section of the of property um, owned by another property owner that still remains in the township, um, which is still an, basically an island. However, this um, does take a good piece of that larger, at one time larger property, and is now bringing it in. Okay, and it and it comes in as RA. 
It comes, yeah, on, yeah. the way our zoning code is right now, everything comes in as RA. I don't know if that was just to, rather than looking at what um, is logically around it, it just, I think they go with the lowest density as, <coughs> is how it was done. I mean, that's something we can discuss at a later point. I, plan, I think it would be yeah. good. I think we talked at the last meeting about yes. planning commission looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is, this is just to turn that into RB, which is what the rest of the neighborhood is. It is on two sides, yeah. They okay. Actually, the other two sides of it are, remains in Miami Township. <laughs> right, okay. So. Any comments or questions from council? This is a first reading, but this one is also an emergency, and uh, I will open the floor for uh, public hearing from comments or questions from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Humphling? Yes. Wintra? Yes. Okay. 17. This is repealing section 1262.08 specific requirements of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio and enacting new section 1262.08 specific requirements. Uh, can I get a motion please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, you're still there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is being my uh, third trip to the podium here. I think <laughs> rather than going back through a general presentation again, I think I just ask if they have any questions, um, comments, or concerns about this 1262.08. This is pretty much the, the main section. Um, you did consent agenda on the other uh, sections for now, which just are definitions and such. Um, but this really is at the heart of what the code is. Um, kind of leave it. And this <laughs> essentially um, creates the pocket neighborhood. Yes, this is the specific requirements. What is the distinction between a two family dwelling or single family attached? A two family dwelling is like a duplex. Yeah. It's simply that it's one structure with. Um, uh, two self-contained units within it. Mm -hmm. um, a uh, single family attached, it can just be three, four, five, all in a row, but they are, but they are um, each self-contained units. So that's a generic, the single family attached would be a generic term and the four. duplex would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And am I right that in the pocket neighborhood, people cannot have sheds, for example? They can have um, common accessory structures, yes, that they'll share. So if, they, if someone wanted a shed, as many people do, can they have it attached to their house? Um, if they make it th It's possible. It is possible. Plan Commission's going to be a little bit flexible with that um, if it's attached to the house. It wouldn't be detached. But I, I would like to point out that part of the purpose of a cottage community is shared services, shared material, shared spaces, so that we don't have a community of 10 homes with 10 lawnmowers and 10 wheelbarrows and, and things like that. So I would think that, that the units could be designed in a way that there would be a closet or some sort of storage for, for some general items but that could um, be part of the we footprint. wouldn't it, yeah. certainly not a garage certainly not no. uh, the kind of shed you'd expect in, in a in a house and planning commission did decide to keep it open as far as the way um, uh, parking would be I mean it, we'll just let people come forward with a design and 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 they can look at it whether you know perhaps it might be a uh, uh, type of carport slash garage parking area that might be nestled between two units um, so that people don't have to walk really far. Others may choose to have it uh, further away, but everything would be connected by uh, pedestrian pathways. And, and since it was raised, uh, my understanding is if there's a current, currently an accessory dwelling, then that needs to become a common. Yes. No, there will be accessory dwellings. There can be. I thought uh, I read that that it if, can, well, if it was a house with an accessory. Oh, well, existing. If it's a house, that can be turned into either a um, community room or guest housing or something like that, or they can just leave it as their house. It can count as one towards the total minimum oh. of four. Oh, okay. Okay. But accessory dwelling units would have to be. Would, would have to then be owned by the common. It wouldn't be. Right. Okay, so they would, they would change. Mm -hmm. And 
it, is this a time to talk about following up on the homeowners association? Because I know Karen raised some questions, and you you wrote a nice report about that. I don't know if. What, I, I think didn't might, answer the question. What, what I think it might be good to highlight. I didn't know if you were going to talk about your summary. Um, well, I can. I mean, the uh, regarding the administration of the homeowners association, yeah. I did mention that we have several residential PUDs in the community five, in particular, some of which have gone and become neighborhood associations. Others that have not yet done that. Um, but regardless of that, they all um, did have to um, present what we call um, CCNRs, which are covenants and conditions and, rest and uh, restrictions. Um, that is what the zoning office uses to determine anything that comes forward. Somebody wants to build an accessory structure or a garage, I have to then pull those specific to that PUD and look to see if whether or not that would be allowed and how and what are the conditions. It isn't going to go by the regular zoning code, so maybe that they have to be, for example, they might have to be 15 feet from another structure, okay. um, that kind of thing. So, um, it, and if it's not in the CCNR, then permission won't be granted. If it's kind of a gray area, then if they if the person can get a, what I've been allowing is if a person can get a letter from the homeowners association they'd have to have a meeting this happened recently where they actually convened a meeting and then the person presented what they wanted to do and then they had to write a letter to me to say that they would exempt that okay. all right so, thank you um, yeah. I, I have another question from, about the paper the summary that you wrote mm -hmm. so I'm still sort of confused about how many units can be in each residential area for the pocket neighborhood because originally I thought at the last meeting it was the same zoning but uh, in four number four it says for example residence a can have up to six units per acre and then for the uh, pocket neighborhood it can have 12 units uh, per acre so is that a result of rounding up right. so if, like, no. if it's so over for an example eight. the zoning code says um, you can have up to six units in residential a per acre if it's if it's a half an acre it, we, we, it's still six if it's three quarters of an acre it's still six if it becomes 1.25 acres <laughs> You can have up to six, as long as you can meet all the setbacks. That's a residence A, six units per acre, and if you only have half an acre, it's still six units. Mm -hmm. If you can meet the setbacks, which it, would be it's very probably difficult to unlikely. Do. Mm -hmm. You'd more, more than likely, maybe you'd be able to do four, which is your minimum, and if you can't do that, um, then you can't do it. Is this only for pocket neighborhoods, or...? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you have 1.25 acres, you could technically go up to 12. That might work in residence B or residence C where you're allowed to have single family attached or two family might be more difficult in residential A because you so can actually have detached. You doing a pocket neighborhood can allow you to have higher density. Yes. Okay. Yes. In, in all districts, yes. In all, in all districts. In all residential districts. In yeah. all residential districts. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. So let's let's go on to uh, 2017. What you're going to do is we're only t we're only voting on this particular right. um, ordinance, oh. but let's have Denise kind of address all of our questions. Yeah. Why did you ask 18 to be brought up? Hmm. Um, because there I, are. I, I can answer that. Do you want 12, to? 2602? Yeah. Okay, or 12.606. 12.2606 is actually not in the zoning code, it's in the planning code. The planning code has never really been reviewed by the planning commission. Um, we, it's not gone through a major update. And there are some discrepancies uh, between the zoning code and planning code that I found, um, but we're just like not going there yet because <laughs> text amendments, we'd be doing them for days. 
So for right now, um, in this pocket neighborhood development, there is a section in there for landscaping that has, you know, if you're a PUD, um, uh, different types of things, these are the requirements for landscaping. So pocket neighborhood development was just added to that. One of the things that Brian brought up was that there's some uh, other requirement standards that are, are not correct now because of ADA compliances for um, sidewalks and he wanted to pull out and, and have a little bit of a discussion about that. Well I just want to make sure that we, if we're going to fix it, I thought we should fix this too. So this is uh, section uh, A3 of 1226.06 and it says that they, uh, that you can build new sidewalks at a minimum of four feet. Um, but if you do that, you then have to have the passing zones every 200 feet, uh, which is something we've learned about in the past. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you have to have it at a minimum of five feet. So I just thought that um, when we bring this back, we should also fix that, that it needs to be ADA compliant. Um, and then the second thing I happened to notice was there's a reference to Appendix B, which is about tree planting. And so I asked Denise to send it to me, just suspecting that maybe it hadn't been updated. And on that list, among other things, is calorie pears as being an appropriate thing to plant. Um, so I actually asked Nick to look at it. And uh, again, that's going far afield of planned neighborhood development, but or pocket neighborhood development. But I thought we should update that too. So and we can do that whenever. Do you want to just make a motion that we? Well, let's. I, I it, just. I just, just changed. The next, we'll just make I just changed my mind that I'm, we're going to go one at a time because it's too complicated to do it all at once. Um, so let's go back to 2017-17, which is basically establishing the language for pocket neighborhoods, esta establishing the requirements for pocket neighborhoods. Um, any more questions or comments from council? Any comments or questions from citizens? We will have another reading on this, so we're not doing this one as an emergency. We will have another reading on this at our next meeting. Um, seeing and hearing none, we'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. House? Yes. Winter? Yes. Okay, then uh, now we've got ordinance 2017-18, title only, Judy. This is repealing section 1226.06 design standards of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new, new section 1226.06 design standards. Okay, um, we've just had that explained to us. Um, Judith, what was the Did recommendation you, you were going to make about you this? go ahead and get a motion on Oh, I'm sorry, motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Okay, so I was going to amend to Brian's two uh, uh, fixes on there in terms of the caliper, whatever those tree uh, pairs, yeah, so would be, calorie uh, pairs that we remove it, and on the um, sidewalks, I'm gonna, I don't know the exact language. Make it ADA compliant. It would be uh, section C3, um, uh, sidewalk, sidewalks at least five feet in width, is yes. that what you're saying? Or having the that you said the pass. Yeah, uh, so I guess we, um, well, I mean, that's arguably something to discuss what we want, but I would say just make it ADA compliant. Okay. Yeah. And then that way. That's kind of broad. Because there could be a reason why you would have a narrower sidewalk as yeah. long as you have. So you just make, instead change it to ADA compliant mm -hmm. rather than saying, specifying yeah. by feet. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to second that motion. Okay. So the ADA, so let's, it let's do one at a time. So we're doing ADA is first. Okay. Second. The, the ADA compliant includes either of those, either yeah. with the path. Okay. Right. So it's either second. above five feet or, or you've got those feet. passing. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. All those in favor, see if I may saying aye. 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 Um, let's go back to the tree thing. It, is there a way for us to use language that references back to the ordinance that we just passed that with all of those tree species and things yeah, on it instead that. of trying to yeah. put that into yeah, this? Yeah, I kind of want to see what Nick comes back with too and then it's just, we're just... Yeah, did I forward I think he, uh, I think he advised us on the last one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's... So, yeah. so, so it seems yeah. like if you just reference that yeah. ordinance. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All those in favor of that? Oh, motion. I make that motion. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
Okay, now let's get back to the actual um, ordinance. ordinance itself. Um, any comments or questions from citizens? Bringing it back, um, Judy, please call the roll. Yes, McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. Templin. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Uh, next is Ordinance 2017-23. This is repealing Section 1260.04, Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1260.04, Uses. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Denise. In, yeah, in discussing this uh, under principal use per lot, um, it became clear to Planning Commission that uh, as we were adding pocket neighborhood developments in there, and we were looking at the criteria. The criteria um, doesn't really apply um, in a lot of cases, and it was saying based on meeting all of the following criteria, mm -hmm. um, especially number two, buildings are under single ownership. That just does not apply, and and won't won't apply in the PUD at Easting and in um, Dayton Yale Springs, and it does definitely not does not apply in any of those five. Uh, that I mentioned of residential PUDs. So we just thought rather than that just say to be a principal as determined by the Planning Commission to be a principal use collectively period and just take out that criteria. I mean there are places in the zoning code which talks about buildings being architecturally unified and compatible but you know you may not always want that. I think it's just best to left, leave it up to Planning Commission. Okay. Any comments or questions from Council? Nope. Comments or questions from citizens? Judy, please call the roll. Yes, Sims. Yes. Templing. Yes. Couch. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintra. Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks, Denise. Good job. Lots of work. Uh, next is first reading of ordinance 2017-25. Title only, please, Judy. This is repealing section 242.01 composition classification of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 242.01 composition classification. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, ah. Okay. Sorry. I, well, I, I is somebody going to explain what yes, that is? Yes. Yeah, you. I mean, I, I feel like I've started to think it's better to have it explained than okay. take all the time with the legalese yeah. language. Okay. So, Patty? I, uh, to be honest with you, I'm just coming back from vacation and I'm trying to, oh, okay, this is the corporal one. Okay. The uh, police department, if you recall, came um, to council under the previous uh, administration and asked um, instead of having two sergeants and a captain, which is what our administrative code said, asking for three supervisors ranked sergeant or above. Um, council passed that. However, Chief Carlson um, has been talking to um, myself, um, the sergeants, Melissa, and um, we believe that it is better to take that additional sergeant position and make two corporals positions, and here's why. First of all, it does give not one but two additional supervisors on the road, um, and that helps us to give better coverage with supervisors on the road. Additionally, it allows for more promotional opportunities. Right now, you're either a sergeant or nothing. This allows us to take officers, bring them up to the rank of corporal, and um, start training them to be sergeants and assume those positions as they come open. Um, and so we feel that this is a better opportunity for the department, for the officers, as well as a benefit to the citizens um, because of giving the better coverage of supervisors on the road. And the financial piece? The financial piece is that the uh, increase that would have given us one sergeant will be taken and divided into the two corporal's positions, and therefore there is no net change in the financial cost of this. Okay. Thank you. Josh, did you have, Sergeant Knapp, did you have anything else that you thought was relevant you want to add? No, there's no questions from the council. Council, questions? I don't have a question. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, we just passed, I, I support this, uh, this uh, proposal by the police department and Chief Carlson. Um, I wanted to suggest that um, 
you know, we just passed this village uh, guidelines for our police department, which it's part of its role. The, the use of it was to be regarding hiring, reviewing uh, position, you know, our, our staff. And part of that has to reference a job description. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming there's gonna be a job description for the corporal that's gonna be different than for a sergeant or, you know, a, a uh, officer. Um, so part of, I know when we were, you know, looking at hiring a new chief, uh, Patty, I think Janet Mueller, and Pat DeWeese, um, you know, rewrote the job description for, uh, for a new chief. And uh, some of the uh, language in that rewriting included these ideas that, uh, uh, that encompass the values of the community that are represented in the guidelines. So I was uh, wanting to suggest that that same little committee, Patty, Janet Mueller, mm -hmm. and Pat, look at, I mean, the, the police department's gonna have the responsibilities of a corporal, which are gonna, you know, have more response, you know, be between the sergeant's responsibility mm -hmm. and the police officers, what do you call them, field officers? Field training officers. Field training or officers. Patrol officers. The patrol right. officers, yeah. So they're gonna have added responsibilities. Um, and then there's these other, uh, you know, values of guidelines and so on that I'm assuming would be in the job description. I wondered if that committee with the chief, maybe the sergeants, would, you know, work on this. Uh, well, there actually is one, and I apologize that it did not oh, make okay. it into the packet. Oh, okay. um, it's something that the chief uh, and the rest of the staff has been working on, and I know that Sergeant Knapp has put a lot of work into it, so we'll let him talk about it. I just wanted to tell you that <laughs> she did it. So it's already kind of in the works. Um, okay. I'm not going to speak for Chief Carlson or Patty, but you know we have some things down on paper that we think will fit nicely into uh, your desires to have that done. And once that's all ready to go, it'll be it'll be part of the next reading. We, I have written a note to put it in the packets for the next reading. Yes. Okay. It, it does it include those sorts of value statements that we would um, expect? It does not, um, only because most of the job descriptions don't if they're not a, a, a salaried employee, like myself, Melissa, or Chief Carlson, or Judy. Um, we can certainly make them part of the general hiring guidelines for all officers in the department, which is what I would recommend more than putting them into the the specific each one. Job. That sounds great, but th that would be separate from the guidelines. Correct. Wouldn't it be a little separate? Correct. Yeah. And there are general. Go ahead. What we've already done is is that our job description, our job details and duties has to be pretty specific of what is required of, of yeah. the officers and any supervisors down there. Um, but what we have done is we've started to amend some of our general orders and policies that will reflect the, the community policing guidelines. So they're two separate entities, if you will, or two separate okay. policies that we have. The job description will be more structured. This is what we expect of you. And then the general orders will reflect more of the community policing standards and guidelines. And they're going to be directly referenced to the Correct. Position. We're, we're kind of two, we're looking at two different things here. So in this position, we're um, you'll have your job duties for this alone, yeah. and then in our our general orders, our operating procedures downstairs that is okay. being altered and looked into changes as well. So it's two different things. Okay. I guess I would uh, like to think about including Janet and Pat maybe in this process, if, uh, since we're, you know. Well, I actually got an email from Janet at the same time I got an email from you. Um, asking for a meeting and I just actually spoke to her right before oh, okay. the meeting and so we're trying to set that up. Okay. I, what I was asking for her was a little different. Yeah. But, okay. but um, I, I mean I wasn't talking I can certainly ask speaking. for her input when we meet. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Sergeant Knapp. Yeah, thanks a lot for and, uh, Sergeant Knapp. Knapp, can we uh, uh, change it to village policing just for consistency with the, the guidelines document instead of community policing? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Because I saw that on the report too, and I like that. Sure. That. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other comments or questions from council? No comments or questions from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, we'll bring it back to the table. Judy, please call the roll. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. House. Yes. Hamflin. Yes. Winter. Yes. 
resolution 2017-41. Okay, this is this beautiful thing that comes over from the county um, huh. auditor that okay. is a little bit hard to read. I'll read the title only. <laughs> yes. If it needs further explanation, Melissa will be the woman. <laughs> yes. This is a resolution accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county auditor. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Sorry. Okay, Melissa. Okay, this is going to be the quickest piece of legislation <laughs> tonight. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. Basically what this is, is if everyone recalls, I went through a formal tax budget at the July 3rd meeting. The county sent us over some property tax figures, which I incorporated into that tax budget, shot it over to the county, and then they basically said, looks good, looks like we'll give you all the money we thought that we would when we sent those numbers over to you back in July. So this basically just sets that in stone should council accept these rates. Um, so what that breaks down to is $258,000 in our uh, property taxes and then $778,000 um, property tax dollars as a result of our levy. So the total that we would be receiving in property tax dollars from Greene County in the year 2018 will be $1,006,000. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from council? No. Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, resolution 2017-42. And this is equally as incomprehensible. <laughs> so this is uh, a resolution enacted by the village of Yellow Springs of Greene County, Ohio. And it follows uh, through a project description which I will let Patty handle because it's, it's literally piece by piece of the project. Right. Actually, Melissa's going to handle it. It's her project. Okay, so can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Melissa, please. Okay, so this is kind of confusing because if everybody remembers, uh, there was an MVRPC grant that was um, applied for for the ADA compliant sidewalk ramps to finish them out in the village. Since this has been kind of an ongoing project to get all of those finished out that would um, do a continuous loop through uh, Xenia Avenue, Dayton, uh, Dayton Street, and then East Enon, and then West South College. So we've had a number of different ramps replaced. We had one last big section in which to do along West South College and Dayton Street. And that MVRPC grant is actually an ODOT let project or an ODOT project. So this is just um, pro forma legislation that happens at the very beginning of the project. We've already had the uh, kickoff meeting. Um, so what this is going to do is this is a $139,000 project. Uh, the the village would be uh, seeing 101,000 in federal funds. The match by the village would be 38,000. And this would be replacing 63 curb ramps um, to be ADA compliant. So those uh, domes and the, the ramps. And that, again, would be along um, West South College and Dayton Street. And the construction of this actually got bumped up because they were saying this could be four years out. And uh, the construction actually got bumped up. It'll be the summer of 2018. So this is the legislation that uh, basically is allowing uh, ODOT to move forward with the project. So they will be paying for all of their portion. None of it would be a pass through from the village. Uh, they will let the project and everything and then the village will just have to pay their portion which is going to be uh, an engineering cost which is the stage that we're at right now. Okay. Comments or questions from council? Well I was just going to say I mean this highlights why it's complicated to uh, get federal funds mm -hmm. so <laughs> which is uh, what NVRPC has control over. So. And it also highlights why it can be extremely expensive. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. all this paperwork in there to get and everything. through all of these regulations. So, mm -hmm. I just have a question. This uh, the, the um, safe routes to schools. I, I, I just sort of occurred to me recently. Where is that? I know it's unrelated to this, but 
Yeah. Um, it is actually set to go into construction very soon. This fall, right? Um, yeah, yeah, this fall. It's going to be completed this fall. Yes, right? it's going to be completed this fall. So, yeah, there's a lot in terms of sidewalks in this ADA compliance uh, going on. So we've got the safe routes to school, which will happen this fall. Thankfully, that's been a really long project. <laughs> um, and then we've got the uh, CDBG grant fund which I kind of referenced uh, with the financials earlier um, that is about to be uh, that bid is about to be awarded by Greene County and though that will finish out Xenia Avenue um, that will finish out Xenia Avenue here very soon as well and then we'll have this project that will be next summer so it's all very exciting stuff and we've had a lot of support from external agencies in terms of funding that have came in for these kinds of things so it's been great I was going to say, you. staff seems like they've done a great job right. at getting us these monies. I, I would like to very much compliment Melissa and Denise. They have worked exceptionally hard on these ramp and dome grants especially, and um, this is amazing what they've been able to secure the funding, and, and that's why uh, Melissa is, is taking the lead on these. These are her projects from start to finish, and she's doing a great job, and Mel Denise has been right there beside her writing the, the grants and everything. So it's, awesome. it's these two ladies right here. Yay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, let's see. 2017-43. This is authorizing the village manager to take the necessary steps to provide financial support and technical assistance in an amount up to $205,000 in green space funds for the Tecumseh Land Trust's proposal to the Natural Resources Conser Conservation Partnership Program. Okay, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Krista, I see you're here. Thank you. You've been patient. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, speaking of federal grants, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the, their claim to fame was this one is they, they say everything that's not in statute can be flexible. <laughs> so that's quite an interesting little challenge, you mm -hmm. know. The um, we uh, have this proposal due. We were asked to do a full proposal. I've talked to, to you guys a few times along the way about uh, after our, our really good outcome of our Jacoby uh, Creek auction uh, last spring, really trying to move on to preserve the rest of the village priorities, which would be uh, those that are shown in red on that map and then also the, the uh, one in five year time of travel around the well field. Um, we'll have a chance, uh, if we're fortunate enough to be uh, funded, uh, we would have a chance to uh, revisit those priorities with council as each year we set what our application criteria are going to be, what our scoring system is going to be, so that your money would go towards your priorities. Um, your money would leverage about $3.4 million from other sources. So it's, it's really a great bang for the buck. Um, and one of the things that we're real excited about with this project is that we would work with the Con Soil and Water Conservation District um, also to set up the application process for installing better conservation practices. So we would hope that we would have some really nice demonstration projects kind of year by year that uh, would give other local landowners and farmers a chance to kind of just see, you know, what's, what's this grass waterway thing about? What are, what are these filter strip plantings? Um, you know, what does this look like? How, how did it go? You know, um, and, and that's entirely new for us. Um, we just went through strategic planning in the last year and that was definitely feedback that we got from people. Great to preserve land. How about let's try to up our conservation game a little bit too. Any questions? And I, okay, sorry. I was just going to say I wanted to commend Tecumseh Land Trust. I want to point out this $205,000 is over a five per year period. So per year it's approximately well, my math isn't very good, but let's see, 40,000. 40, um, we have been putting in 25,000 yearly in the past years. I think some years maybe 50. Um, it's, with that to come to the land trust, this, you know, three million and some dollars that we can leverage with just upping a little bit our yearly commitment is huge. <laughs> and um, 
And so just really appreciate the work of PLT on this. I, I think it's important to point out that it's, I mean, we don't know that it's going to be $40,000 every year. It could be nothing one year and it could be right. more than next I'm just year. Saying it's so an average, it's an so average. it sounds like a big chunk of money right. and it is right. a big chunk of money. It's a big commitment. But the reason we need to do it out front is to have the possibility right. of leveraging over $3 million. And, and so it that's is, it's, it's, this is again something unique about this project is to have that commitment from the federal government for just these two sub watersheds. Is, is just very, very different. And we're, we're never in the position of being able to say, you know, to landowners when we reach out, you know, this is a five-year project. So we hope you'll apply this year. If you don't, you've got a few more chances. Mm -hmm. But the money is going to run out at a certain point. And we'll see if that ups our success. So, so we can look at this as a five-year project. Um, it's spread out as 40000 a year for five years, as has been said, but it, that money could come or would, might be needed at any time during that five years, but the village is committing itself to fi a five-year plan. And being a partner, and 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 I've got to say that what the the village's um, steadfast priorities for preservation are a very appealing part of this project. And do you expect, since it sounds like this is a pretty groundbreaking idea, that there might be other monies as as potentially other conservation organizations or yeah. government entities? look and see its successes happening, that other money might become available? Uh, there definitely is. For one thing, we're working with Wright State on this, and they're now a land-grant college, and so they are eligible for some research monies that there's only 130 universities in the United States uh, that can, can even apply for. Uh, there are evidently a lot of these projects that have been funded. Um, have also decided we left something out and we need to do a conservation improvement grant um, that is targeted money to um, uh, perhaps uh, research an additional conservation practice that we didn't think would be included in the project or uh, to fund equipment that's needed that we didn't foresee was, was going to be needed. Um, it's, those are, are very, very flexible. Um, they can be very technical, but they can also be pretty broad too. So it, it's a good chance. And I, it's very exciting, I think, with Community Solutions having purchased one of the, the Arnabit's properties. Um, it, um, they're very willing to, to be a demonstration site. And uh, that's, that's just fantastic. I and mean, we don't expect every landowner that preserves their land or improves their conservation practices to, to welcome company all the time. But um, that's, that's going to be a really nice opportunity to have that. Thanks, Krista. And I want to point out, because over the years, we've a lot of concerns have been expressed about what our green belt is doing to affordability. And so I'd like to point out that while we're investing in this green belt significantly, just as we, we just did a few pieces of legislation ago, we're also working on increasing density. We just um, basically released engineering for the Center for Business and Education to get development there. And we're doing every, everything we can to increase density opportunities within the village. So we're, we're increasing the opportunities within while we're trying to, to maintain that agricultural perimeter that everybody loves so much. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing, Krista. Can you just, uh, 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 I guess, briefly describe the TA piece of this? Uh, technical assistance really is um, specific to application. So you're at a point where you've got a landowner that really uh, wants to put a conservation easement on their land or wants to um, get, in, in the case of your, your money and your technical assistance. Uh, but with some of the other organizations participating, it might have to do with conservation practices that are funded through EQUIP. So visits to property, planning for specific applications and dedicating monies to specific properties. That's the technical assistance piece. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Comments or questions from citizens? Okay. Megan? Oh, I'll get you in a second, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, Megan from the news. I'm Here's just this, this right regarding Megan. any specific properties or areas, if you could describe the areas that this 
Uh, the the Jacoby Greenbelt um, has been, you know, a long-held priority. The the properties that are in red on the western side of the map um, are ones that council within the last uh, year has prioritized within that whole Greenbelt area um, as as their their highest priorities. And then their next highest priority has been those time of travel areas around um, the well head area. Bob, and the rest of the, the whole watersheds thing can be really complementary mm -hmm. to, to what we do in, in preserving those properties as well. It will help with the water quality as they filtrate through. Bob, you got a comment? Sure. Question, come on up. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we have to hear you and see ya. We want to see on camera. <laughs> In the main, I have supported the uh, concept of green space. Uh, but at this present time, I do not put the huge priority on it that council and Tecumseh Land Trust seems to put on. Uh, I understand the aim of council and Tecumseh is to totally surround our little town with conservation easements, which means people are going to get paid to sign an easement to protect it in perpetuity and maybe build one house. I did not quite understand why council passed a resolution prior to the Arnavis auction of nine parcels that said we will not extend any village utilities to any of these parcels. You did the same thing when the 100 acre Archie Peterson farm sold in 1970. So what, what we're doing is we are closing down the available building space for commerce or residences. And I say don't, don't cease it. But I sit here where I can't get a parking spot in front of Deaton's. I sit here where people come to me at King John and say, where, you only have one restroom? Where is it? This is ludicrous. You have just spent $298,000 of tax money going to help the people that bought the nine parcels at the auction so they can get conservation easements. That's our money, that's tax money. It's done, but to talk about another 200,000, it sounds like you're gonna spread it over uh, three or four years without addressing parking without addressing restrooms is just absolutely ludicrous. I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm saying I think there have to be some monetary priorities ahead of these commitments for green space. I think Yellow Springs absolutely wants to surround themselves and protect this little island of civility and social progress, but it's coming at a certain cost of other needs. And sooner or later, I will give you a lesson in what is happening to the population of our community. I'll start with just one. When the Archie Peterson farm sold, we were 4,986. You get to 5,000, we become city status. We lose our, our council, our mayor, and the and the council said, we don't want to be 5,000. So they never extended utilities to that 105 acres. They built two A-frames, that's all. That's done. But our population, again, was 4,985. Now it's 3,400. Now, if you think about it, that is quite a reduction in population. I was on the school board in 1970. We had... 12,091 students, one through 12. Now we are K through 12. They've added kindergarten. We now have, uh, there are 20 people floating around, either 560 or 580. That includes the 60 students that bring the state of Ohio money into our community because we have the room in our classes. I think. 33% of those 60 students are, no, I'm sorry, a third of them are probably ADHD. We have the resources, we have the emotion to help these kids, and we do it. That's fine. Thank you.
Thanks. One third are probably coming in from other districts that there's either some bullying or a bad fit, it doesn't work, they come. The other third are people with parents that really think their students will get a Thanks. superior education in y'all's space, and they are right. Bob. If they've got home help so far, okay, okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll end up real quick. <laughs> At the same time, we lose 60. Homeschooling, private schools, Catholic schools, Montessori schools. So we're still at 560 or 58. That is a far cry from 1,291. When I was on school board, we, oh. we had 119 seniors. Now we've got 55. So Thanks. Thanks, the demographics, Bob. you have to see what's happening to our community. And I don't think council has paid enough attention to the history lessons of how this town has changed over the years. I think it's time to give it more Thanks, Bob. emphasis. Thank you. I will answer a couple of things. One is that the, the amount expended on the Arnovitz auction properties was $94,000. Not 114 altogether. 114. But from the village. But so how much village money? 70. 70. Okay. So it was much, it wasn't 200 and, Ninety some. It was only seventy seventy thousand dollars in the range of seventy thousand dollars. I read the authorization in the in the News as one hundred ninety-eight. You were authorized. We were authorizing, and we just pulled that money back. We just okay. we just put that money back because it wasn't needed. Okay. Um, I, I personally think we are paying attention to the demographics, which is one of the reasons that we're working very hard to increase housing density within the village. Um, uh, and I will tell you that, and I, well, and I will mention the the, rail, the 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 restroom situation. I think the village is doing a pretty darn good job between this building and the train station. I think the village is kind of doing their part in providing public facilities um, for visitors to town. I, I I don't know how many toilets we're providing, but we're providing more than mo a lot of places are. So there are other opportunities for restroom facilities um, that aren't public, that aren't public. Um, and the final thing I will say about land preservation is that I sit on um, Green County Regional Planning and at our last meeting, we had a, at the end of the meeting when, when a 100 acre plot of land south of Xenia was requested to be um, the zoning to be changed from prime agricultural land to residential, we said no. Because, and, and at the end of the meeting, we all sat there and said, what are we going to do? We can't keep doing this. We can't keep sucking up agricultural land and turning it into housing developments. I see Sugar Creek Township is they have nowhere to go. I mean, they, they are losing agricultural land every day. And houses are coming in. They can't support the houses that, that they're getting throughout that township. So um, I think that we are really cognizant of everything you said, Bob, um, and, and that we're working, and we have been working very hard to address those issues. Thanks, Karen. I ditto that. Okay. Um, thanks, Bob. We love having you here. Um, I guess we still have to vote, right? Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, okay, now is a nice resolution. Um, would you read this? Is anybody here to receive it? No. Um, okay, I've got a nice yeah, plan. Was here. Was that? Uh, is she she'll be back. No, too. but she's village mediation. Village mediation. Oh, oh. Let's read this in by in oh, full, yeah. Judy. Sure. This is recognizing the Yellow Springs Village Mediation Program on the occasion of its 30th anniversary. Whereas since its inception in 1987, the Village Mediation Program of Yellow Springs has existed oh, to, yeah. to, fa yeah. to facilitate informal resolutions of community disputes among the citizens of Yellow Springs. And whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs wishes to honor and recognize the influence of the Village Mediation Program upon various entities, including citizens, businesses, Village Council, Mayor's Court, civic organizations, and law enforcement. And whereas without committed volunteers who serve as mediators and coordinators, the Village Mediation Program would not exist.
And whereas those who have volunteered to serve in the Village Mediation Program have dutifully facilitated public dialogue, forums, and community engagement on various topics for 30 years, now therefore be it resolved that. Section 1, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs hereby expresses its gratitude to this dedicated organization for 30 years of service to the Village. Section 2, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs hereby declares September 14, 2017 as Village Mediation Program of Yellow Springs Day in the Village. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? I so move. Second. Okay. Um, Mary Ann, you're the representative. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> I was on the founding uh, board of the mediation program, which was initially started by Diane Alexander, who was clerk of courts. And I think, it, I'm not sure if it was Kent Bristol's idea. I'm not sure whose idea it was, but there's still a number of us around who were in uh, that first cohort. And the uh, celebration is on the 14th. I'm the council liaison mm -hmm. for the mediation program, and I would be happy to take that to the celebration and present it. <laughs> and could you talk about the celebration? When is it? You said it's 14th? It's the 14th and it's at 7 o'clock. But you know, I'm not sure if it's here or if it's at Andy. Uh, know, I thought it was at AUM, but let me yeah, look at my I, calendar but, real quick. Yeah, I wrote it down, but I didn't write down where. I was going to say uh, some of these more difficult discussions uh, the village has had to have in these larger meetings, like, you know, post the New Year's Eve event. Um, the most recent school meeting that they had, mediation has run those, you know, has um, helped uh, run those meetings. Uh, they're a real resource, and yeah, they're, it's really excellent for us to have them available. Oh, yeah. And do we know yet if it's at a, um, we'll, we'll make sure that maybe that gets onto the Facebook page. Yeah, I'm checking with John right now. Okay. Um, so thank you. Oh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, well, before the meeting well, ends, we'll let everybody know. Oh, yes. Thanks, Marianne, for your work in getting it started. Okay, that was a long list of legislation. Now we're to the citizens' concerns portion of the agenda. We have one more. Okay, I'm sorry, you're right. Go ahead. I got confused. Smoking um, Where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Are we not doing the smoking? It's we are in, later. it's not legislations, it's a discussion. Oh, 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 sorry. Says draft. Gotcha. Um, so, that, so we ask you to come to the uh, podium and state your name and keep your comments to three minutes. Seeing and hearing none, um, we will come back. We will move on to old business. And Shernaz is not here, so we will um, go to the discussion of draft housing work plan. I can do the draft smoking. I wrote it. Okay. So. Um, okay. So we will we will start with the uh, smoking limitation policy uh, draft legislation that uh, Patty wrote. So um, if council remembers. Um, Several months ago, Shernaz, reporter from the Health District, came and asked the council to consider um, passing legislation that um, eliminated or limited smoking on village-owned properties. Um, after discussion, council asked me to bring a draft that limited smoking, uh, did not eliminate it um, because we do have so many different public gatherings and rentals and everything else on our properties. This is the draft legislation. It is uh, modeled after the sample legislation that, um, that the health district sent us. And what it does is it does limit uh, smoking on village-owned properties to specific areas that we will designate and um, staff would get together, determine the proper location for those away from doorways that it's still convenient enough uh, for folks to get to, but it also takes it away from the doorways and the public accesses of the building so that the secondhand smoke is not um, still being inhaled as people go in and out. Um, there is also a provision for when properties are too small to designate a smoking area, for instance, the Fair Acres Pocket Park. 
um, that smoking would be entirely eliminated on those properties. Um, the only question that we have is the, um, and you can see it's in red there because um, Chris and I were having discussions about what the penalties for this would be. The, the enforcement of this is intended to be, excuse me, could you please move away from the door and go to the designated smart smoking area. Um, if you refuse to comply, you get a warning. It would, it would be stepped up progressive type thing. And I believe the conclusion that we came to would that this would become a disorderly conduct. Um, correct, Chris? So if someone consistently refused to comply with an officer's request to move away and go to a designated smoking area or to extinguish whatever they were smoking, um, then they would eventually be cited with a disorderly conduct to the ma to mayor's court. So that was the only question that we had about the enforcement. Uh, that's why it's in red. That's what we came up with as far as how this would be enforced by the police department on village properties. So Patty, we currently allow smoking in like Gaunt Park and yes, it's open. Yes. Okay. I would suggest we have a little. Um, uh, a little card that has some of the information here because actually as I read this information I, I mean I didn't know you know that being outside can have as much of an impact in terms of secondhand so uh, smoke as in us well you know so you know smoke I'm sure there are a lot of people that just are not informed right. and don't realize that maybe we could develop some little kind of a, I, I'm guessing or maybe, maybe or yeah maybe she has something we could probably like hand out and say it. you right. know and the also the health department does have a grant they're going to provide some of the signs okay. that okay. that show folks you can't smoke here or you can only smoke in designated areas so they do have a grant that's kind of why Shernaz was here they're very supportive of us passing this obviously they would prefer a complete elimination of smoking but I believe council just felt that that wasn't um, wasn't the right way to go for for the village do you know how it's going to be addressed with events like the street fair music festival and that basically takes up the whole area of the front yard well what we were thinking about was uh, maybe a small smoking designated smoking area towards the back of the property if you go out that door um, and you go towards mm -hmm. the woods a little bit away from the windows because Melissa and her staff sometimes have their windows open so away from the window so that the smoke doesn't come in, but make a designated area over there with perhaps a picnic table or something like that, you know, appropriate so, containers. So it would be, so you would, so you're thinking ahead that the designated smoking areas would be, you're thinking ahead to the events, like the 4th Correct. of July Correct. at Gaunt Park and right. um, where are you going to put this? And again, at these like events, it's going to be a more of, could you please step over to the designated smoking? I mean, it's not going to be a, a, an immediate, we're going to enforce this, you know. Well, and I also like that in particular, because part of this resolution focuses on the modeling to our youth, uh, you know, besides just the proximity. Um, I guess I want to say, uh, I, I, I suppose I understand why we're talking about an exception uh, here at the Bryan Center mm -hmm. um, because of employees, but um, I, I guess personally, I don't, I think we should ban smoking completely at the parks. Well, we do have uh, events at some of our parks. Like, for instance, we have events at Gaunt Park and we have events at Ellis Park. Um, and people do smoke at those events. and. So it's it's a question of you know the, the rentals and things. So. Would you explain? I maybe I don't know if it would maybe be good if Shanaz was here. I mean, what's the situation with streets and sidewalks? We're not even talking about streets and sidewalks, which are village property. Yeah, correct. And so what I mean, what is the situation? Is somebody so can if could somebody go onto the sidewalk? Let's say we did ban it completely at Gaunt Park. Could they simply go onto the sidewalk? Chris. Sorry. I think if one, if there were a uh, an, a rash of smoking ban enforcement uh, 
actions taken throughout the state when we would know about it. It's, it's an exceedingly hard ban to enforce against those who want to ignore it. But I think that over time, I think that we've seen that people have come, become used to the law. They're respecting what the expectation is. So I, I think that in the sense of uh, what I'll call common sense, rational enforcement, uh, which is consistent with the standards that the, the village and council have been talking to PD about, is that it, one it expects that, that what I'll call progressive discipline model that starts with, hey, would you please do this? And I think that we you find that most people will ultimately comply with that. Um, it's the rare instances where I, I, it rises to that next level. That's when I think Patty's right when you start talking about if you actually wanted to enforce this, my guess is that the police interaction would rise to the level of a disorderly conduct act, independent of the smoking, because they would be that individual would be continuing to engage in offensive conduct or persistent conduct, which is embraced by the by the context and the elements of disorderly conduct. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, where do, where do streets and sidewalks fall? Well, the. Uh, if you went, I believe, and I have not researched this, but if you went to a c complete ban, I think that it would, you would not be able to smoke on streets and sidewalks either. I'm not for doing that. I think, um, you know, unless we want to hire another <laughs> five police officers to enforce this, I just, I think we, need to, we should think of it as educational um, in terms of our, uh, at least as a first step, let's do this, let's see how it goes. But I, I just, I mean, I think it's kind of a practical question too. And, and we're trying to, we want our police officers to have good relationships with the people, you know, around them. And you're asking them to enforce all this stuff. It's just, you know, it's, to me, we should just start here and let's see where it goes. I could share with you that uh, my son, who's now enrolled at the University of Cincinnati, they have gone to an entirely smoke-free campus, and there are no designated smoking areas. Central so, State is a smoke-free Pardon me? Central yeah, a lot of, I mean, campus. if you're going to say, uh, you know, we're going to ex exempt the Bryan Center, in fact, you know, many hospitals, many medical organizations, there is no smoking when you work at all. You know, so that's not an exception, actually, that's being... Do people, so I assume in those situations, I'm not saying people go happen. to their cars? Well, that, as a hospice nurse, we were told we were not allowed to be smoking in our car because part of our work is we're driving places. Well, we were on the clock. I mean, I imagine during your break, you know, that's your own time. But other than that, you know... Well, and then you smell like smoke. Uh, I mean, talk about... Yeah. Students yeah. at Central State drove off campus. Wow. Campus. Mm -hmm. But I, I think let's take this. I, was, I, I agree with Judith. Yeah. I, I think we take this step. And in terms of modeling, quite honestly, I think a modeling of youth is mostly, you know, where you see heavy smoking in families that you smoke. I don't think the modeling in a park where kids playing of a, you know, somebody who, you know, they don't know is smoking. I mean, I'm not sure that has such a great impact. I think it's more you know, generally these kind of modeling is, is more... But it impact. is in this resolution. It's one of the... <laughs> it's one of the reasons. It's, yeah, it's well, one of the first whereas is. Yeah. Um, what is... About... I mean, I think it's it's worth, it's worth it's worth keeping it in there, but I, I still think let's take this first step and see where it goes. And, but I don't want to put our police department in a position to... Well, and I guess I will say... Um, I mean, I'm going to vote yes for anything, but I did want it to be on the record that I think um, we should consider, you know, a, a broader ban. But doing that doesn't mean that our officers, you know, suddenly have to be, uh, you know, heavily enforcing this. Mm -hmm. So that's not an automatic thing. I, I'm in favor of having a place where people can smoke. I mean, if we start, uh, I mean, you know, we could have people not drive cars and vehicles if we really want to, I mean, there's so many things that people do that aren't in the end maybe healthy, but uh, I think having a place for people to smoke somewhere, I'm in favor of as opposed to no smoking. Right, I, I, that's, that's what I would support. And you know, if, if down the road, if it looks like it makes more sense to go to a complete ban, then that can happen. So right now I support. So I guess we'll just 
um, and, and was everybody okay? I think Patty was asking. Um, everything was okay as far as the punishment, the, the misdemeanor the, or a uh, violation. A uh, disorderly conduct is a ticket. We're not arresting them, are we? It, it, well, it, it, Josh, there's, there's two kinds. One, <laughs> one is technically arrestable, but again, the officers can exercise their discretion. My recommendation would be for this ordinance that we put in, where the we have the blank, is that it's a minor misdemeanor with a fine up to $150, which is what the law says. It's like a traffic ticket. One For a violation of this ordinance, there would be no arrest uh, because it, it wouldn't be permissible. I mean, one thing uh, we're looking at, you know, is this uh, disparate impacts on the poor of <laughs> these kind of tickets. So, you know, that's something that we're going to be looking at. So, I don't know. Maybe we just leave it minor misdemeanor. Well, <laughs> well, minor misdemeanor, the possible penalty is a, is a financial only and it's zero. To one, up to $150. Okay. And it would go that's to mayor's range. court. That's yeah, the intent yeah, would be to go to mayor's, mayor's court. court. Okay. Yeah. And, and Judith, for someone to get arrested for this, they're going to have to be pretty darn combative. And, and, and that could be a different arrest then. At that point, the, the arrest isn't for the smoking, the right. arrest is for right. fighting with a police officer. <laughs> So, so okay. So, so this will come to the next meeting as a as a as, as, is it is it a is it an ordinance? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's do two readings on it. I don't see any reason to make an emergency. And I mean, we really do have a lot of events. It's it's right. going to be really busy here this fall. Should we talk about timing? I mean, should, are we going to make it? What's the earliest possible date it could? Go I'll, into effect. I'll have to sit down and talk to the staff about the designated smoking areas and what we That's need good. to do. So should mm -hmm. we just do it for the first of the year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. we also don't know about the, the signage and everything. Yeah, let's, yeah. Go, let's, yeah. let's make it for January 1. And you had also it, contemplated bringing it back on October 2nd just because you've got this hot Okay, then of, since, we're, since it's not an emergency, let's just hold off on that then. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree. We'll yeah. get it later. Um, okay, discussion of draft housing work plan. Um, I know there was another document in the packet uh, from Marianne. So Marianne, would you like to talk about that? Yes, I would very much like to talk about it. <laughs> so after the last council meeting, I sat down and Judith and I have met a couple times. Um, but my goal was to look at what are the tasks that uh, need to happen in order to move the housing needs assessment forward effectively and then after that to develop uh, an effective housing policy that has strategies and uh, concomment is that the word with that um, develop a plan for housing on the glass farm so we we are uh, very close to having uh, some uh, housing needs uh, proposals come to the village. What What's the date deadline, Patty? The 11th? Uh, the 22nd, I think. When they are need to be submitted? I thought it was the 11th. Well, at, any, at any rate, so this month um, we will be getting some proposals from potential providers to do a housing needs assessment. And the housing needs assessment uh, we will actually work out in some degree with the provider what all will be in that assessment. At, at any rate, it will be a pretty comprehensive document talking about uh, trends in Yellow Springs in terms of housing, uh, economic data, the kind of housing uh, that is most needed in Yellow Springs, looking at the Dayton uh, Springfield region, looking at people who are um, housing um, stressed, is that the word, I forget, Pe people who are paying more than 30% of their income for housing, um, looking at rental housing compared to home ownership. I mean, it's going to be a pretty comprehensive uh, study that's done. And um, I've been around um, co on council and around village government enough to know that sometimes when we have providers come in to do things, well, we're asking them for two reasons. One, because we don't have the capacity, and sometimes we don't have the, the expertise. And so we're always at a disadvantage because we don't have the expertise. And so what I'm wanting to do for this housing needs assessment is to make sure that we have our ducks in a row and we have some expertise on our side so that we can engage 
both in looking at um, the proposals that come to us and engage with the provider uh, who we choose and do some work uh, with local groups and local volunteers so that we can reach out into the community to find out what the community sees as our need, housing needs. So uh, what I've done is I've created this two-sided document that looks at the tasks that I think need to be done through the end of this year and then into next year. Um, briefly, the tasks that need to be done through the end of this year one I think is what where we need to be focusing and that involves choosing who the provider is going to be for the assessment and then supporting that assessment while it's being done and then having a report hopefully at one of our uh, at a December council meeting so uh, what I'd like to do with council approval is to have uh, a two or at least two uh, people who have housing expertise to work with uh, two council members, one or two council members, I, I would like to be one of those council members, um, and staff, particularly uh, our village manager, um, our planner, and possibly Melissa, our, our financial person, assistant village manager. Um, at the stages that need to be, uh, that we all need to be addressing this. And um, I have talked so far with Kevin Magruder, who um, it works at Antioch, uh, has worked in housing development in Cleveland, Ohio, and in New York City. And we've also talked with uh, Liz Voigt, who uh, left rather early in her Yellow Springs tenure, who has agreed, but she has extensive housing development experience as well. And I've talked with both of them about working <coughs> with us. For example, looking at the proposals that come in, uh, helping us uh, work with the housing uh, needs assessor, uh, and uh, helping us work with the community. So the two roles that I see that we need to do for this calendar year are one, having the expertise that we need in-house and with uh, some assistance from people that we, who are willing to work with us, and then having assistance through, for example, the village mediation program to develop some community uh, focus groups to reach out to citizens. and. Uh, I've talked to John Gudgel, who's willing to have the mediation program help in that regard. We've, uh, in talking with the people that I've talked to so far, we've talked about having four community meetings that would focus on uh, allowing people to come and talk about what they see as housing needs in Yellow Springs. And we've talked about involving the senior center, and we've talked to the uh, Karen Wolford at the senior center, um, involving young families and young adults, and Don Breuer from the schools is our contact person who will be helping from the, uh, with the schools, um, reaching out to the minority community, especially the African American community, uh, and having uh, a group that target focuses on that group, and then having one general uh, meeting for anyone who wants to come. And so these would be facilitated discussion groups uh, allowing people to have input uh, within a group setting. I also think it's important that we have surveys that people can fill out individually, both probably online as well as hard copy. And how that piece gets done, I that remains to be seen, but it is something that needs to be worked on. Um, and then I've, I've outlined some things for the next year, which would be involving uh, developing the housing policy and starting work on planning for housing on the glass farm. Um, I think I'll stop now, uh, except to just to say I really think we need to start working right away on what we will be doing this year. So I'd, I'd like to get comments and questions, thoughts from council. 
Um, I guess I, I want to just put in a, fill in a little more detail um, that I've been thinking about in regards to all of this. Um, first, uh, first of all, yeah, I was I was thinking that um, we should tonight make a decision about, um, if possible, uh, who is going to help Marianne, uh, Patty. I don't know who else, and looking at these RFP responses the, uh, and making a decision on the consultant that we're hiring for the housing needs assessment. And I would like to suggest that, be, that Liz Voigt and uh, Kevin Magruder, who, ha who are experienced in housing needs assessments, um, help with that process. I know Marianne already mentioned them, but I, I support that idea. Um, I, I was thinking that we really need to identify who of staff is really going to lead on this. And I would very much think it would be Patty. I mean, it's, this is going to be a very large project. And Denise, and that we kind of see them as taking the lead uh, in terms of the staff. Um, this piece about the input for the housing needs assessment, um, one thing that I talked to Liz Boyd also, as well as Mary Ann, and um, she pointed out to me, you know, we don't have to figure out all the detail of getting that because they are going to give, they, you know, part of what we want from them is to, you know, we want to have meaningful discussions. We don't want to have an open, wide open discussion about what are the housing needs. That's not going to give us the input, this, the qualitative input. That is going to, so that's one of the questions, you know, of the consultants, you know, they are no doubt standard, uh, you know, uh, questionnaires and you know assistance that they can provide for how you get that input including the electronic if people are going to go online you know questionnaires um, but also those meetings what I would think is once we hire that person they come to a council meeting I'm getting very concrete now <laughs> they come to council and they make a presentation of what they're going to do or I don't know if we hear from them before we hire them I'm not sure maybe not maybe we wait and, you know <coughs> try to trust this this group of people to make that decision. Um, but anyway, once, with the, once the decision is made that they come and present to council and they make clear the kind of data that they are going to be looking for from the community. Um, and, I, and then after that, there's these, you know, Marianne mentioned, you know, seniors, um, young singles and families. And then um, there's going to be what I think of as, you know, the Wait, what was, oh, and then people of color, particularly in this community, the African American community. Um, and then this fourth, maybe catch all for people who don't necessarily fit in any of those categories. Um, I was thinking staff could coordinate those meetings um, in terms of where they are. They should be places where those groups of people will be comfortable and, you know, be able to draw on those communities, organizations that are going to draw those people into these discussions. Um, uh, you know, the consultant's not going to come to every one of those meetings. I'm not sure the mediators are going to be in a position. So, you know, I'm not quite sure who's leading that discussion because it's going to be somebody who has to have some knowledge. I don't know if it's Denise and Patty? I'm not sure who that is. Maybe Marianne? I don't know who that is exactly. But I think that has to be someone who has some understanding of what this is all about. Um, and, but, so I was thinking of Patty and Denise as kind of coordinating that piece. I don't know how you feel about it, but because I think it's, you know, and that they would be interacting with, you know, Senior Center is one focus, say. Maybe that meeting's at the Senior Center. Maybe the African American community, maybe it's happening at, I don't know, the AME Church or, or the Baptist Church or, or someplace like that with the help of 365 and so on. Um, you know, the school is a good locus for young families, but I don't know where the single, you know, the young artists, the singles, I don't know how we draw those people in maybe. But um, mm -hmm. so I was thinking of, yeah, Denise and Patty is coordinating that with the help of, you know, you know, people in the community who are leaders in those community in those particular communities, and um, that you know that they just coordinate that and and try to think a little more carefully about who is leading those. I mean, mediation helps to coordinate it. There's probably materials coming from the consultant 
uh, to help focus those discussions. But you know, I'm not quite sure who those people are. But anyway, that was my thoughts. I'd like to start with, I guess, Marianne and Patty. How do you see the selection being made of the housing needs, the consultant? I, I was uh, seeing it as uh, assuming I'm the council person, and if there is another council person, so one or two council people, Patty, Denise, and Liz and Kevin. So and, and there is a there is a <coughs> waiting percentage in the RFP of what the the decision will be based on. I mean there is a this is how we're gonna make our decision as part of the RF. Yeah, yes, there are criteria. It's yes. not weighted though. Well that's correct. We took the weighting off. But there are criteria. And, and, and the question then well and we would like to keep this under thirty thousand or less. The question is should we come back to council for approval? I mean if there's a provider selected, should we come to council for approval? At, well, first of all, do you accept what I was well, what I would yeah, I mean I I think if if it comes back to council, I would think that you'd want maybe a, a short list, and I'm not saying this that that I that I agree that I think that I'm directing you to do this, but if it comes back to council and and you don't keep it within this small group, then I would think council would want to th see a short list and not you know I, and, and again, we don't know how many proposals we're going to get. Yes, it I may agree. not be any. If, if, it, if it falls under uh, Patty's uh, uh, limit, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've had a lot of discussions on it and we all agree and I think putting the group together as Marianne says, you know, unless it, it, it's high and it needs our approval monetarily rise, I say let's, let's leave it up to the group and, and let's, let's move forward with, with it versus having it to, you know, come back to council. Well, unless there's like a question or, you know, unless there's something, yes. one's offering one thing and you're not quite sure, maybe then it come back yeah. to council. I say leave it up to the group and let, let's move forward. And I would like to add Melissa to that group because for a couple of reasons. First of all, she's the assistant village manager. She's very astute when she's reading these proposals. But secondly, you don't want an even number because what if you tie? So. Um, well, you know, there are two scenarios that sound familiar to me. One is uh, when we picked a solar array provider and uh, we relied heavily on the expertise of the energy board. Um, but that did still come back to council. And I believe there was some kind of comparison of the, the two. Um, and then Design 9 was the other one where we used um, the Fiber Advisory Board. Um, but those were also larger. Yeah. Th those were over her, over Patty's. Mm -hmm. Well, Brian, are you saying you would like it to come back to council? Um, probably. I mean, I don't think. I mean, I, I mean I'm, not I'm fine. not in the way that I think. I, I, I don't, don't think it needs to, to hinder the process. I wouldn't like it to uh, delay the process. Right. So that would mean Octo it would be the October meeting, the October second meeting. I mean, it might be a way to keep us on task because you guys will have to figure out where you, where you stand on it for it to get to our meeting. Patty, do you have that timeline? I I don't have I it don't. in my phone. But I if you said if it was September 22nd, I think it's like the end of September when it's supposed to come it back. It is because they get to ask questions on the 9th and then it no, was no, today the is the day oh, is that for today? questions okay. and I have to answer them by um, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I did have inquiries from two firms, um, but. Um, I'm pretty sure it's at the end of the month and we were bringing uh, a recommendation to either the second, the meeting on the second or the meeting on the 16th. But um, I think October. it was the second, yeah. Yeah, it's not on here. I mean, it's not on the, it's not no, on this it's not agenda. On. It's, it's on the, well, I might have that. I mean, council wants to stay in this, in the center of the process, which is this, this approach keeps us there. So us, to you, sorry. <laughs> So, so making that decision come back to council, I think, actually helps keep us in and knowledgeable that's about what's, this. you know, in, well informed. That schedule. Yeah, I'll go with. Yeah, I, that's a, 
proposing to do Monday. So oh, okay, here I have a copy of the RFP. So it's due the 11th? Mm -hmm. The RFPs are? Proposals due the 11th. Yeah. Contract award to September 18th, so clearly this did not um, notice to proceed the 19th, September 19th, so clearly this timeline didn't include council. Well, input. we have a meeting on September 18th. Well, how about this suggestion? Why don't we see who we get, do a comparative breakdown like we did for the solar array, which simply listed you know, this is what this firm is offering at this price, et cetera, et cetera. It was kind of put into a chart. The Energy Board made a recommendation. Mm -hmm. So council got to see an essential breakdown of the proposals, but went with the recommendation of the Energy Board. So we'll do that on, on September 18th. We'll put that on the September 18th. And then I, I guess I also do think uh, we should have a sec second council member. Well, I've been working on I this. I figured, okay. So I, yeah. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't say but, that. Well. <laughs> so so on, the, on the 18th, you'd be coming back with a recommendation? Mm -hmm. With legislation. With legislation. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. we'll be ready okay. for that, yeah. Yeah, I can go it, It's very tight mm -hmm. to get the contract ready, but usually they're fairly standard. Yeah. Um, okay, and so are we done work. Are we then done with this discussion? Um, no, we, we, we'll, we'll have other discussions on it, right? Yes. As, based on yes, I think we will be discussing this at every meeting. Okay. Does any does any council or staff have anything else that they want to say in regard to things that we need to be doing this calendar year? I, I mean, I, I, I guess I feel like we, we shouldn't be getting too far ahead of ourselves until we Can have a consultant results? on board. Yep. It's, okay. you know, I, I would, I would assume that they, that they're going to be, you know, giving us the advice, and that part of, one of the criteria is going to be their public, um, engagement process. That's, okay. I'm going to be looking at okay. that pretty strongly. Hmm. Okay, good. So, um, but I do like that this was all laid out. Thanks a lot for doing that. And uh, I think the tasks piece is really important. So. And given that this is a project that staff and council will be involved in, um, it, well, first of all, any help in process and thinking about it and timeline and everything, but this can be uh, an, maybe a test of some of the things we've been talking about, about being thoughtful and how we move along. And, and not account, dropping things. And, and accountable. And accountable. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Um, Brian, you wanted to talk about complete streets? Uh, yeah. So I think, um, I guess we've got two things that, that we could consider. Uh, maybe there are other ideas. One is, do we have a separate public forum? Um, and it sounded like at the last meeting there was some interest in that. Um, a second option that has occurred to me is a special report to council. Uh, and so, you know, we do it in this uh, forum. Um, I know that, uh, Judith, you were working, but the rest of us were uh, at that Complete Streets workshop, and, and I think we were all pretty impressed, as was staff. Um, so I guess that's the first thing is, is there a preference? I think it's a good idea to do a little presentation here because, you know, the community will hear it okay. you know, as well as me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do we also want to have a public forum or do we feel like that might, what do you guys, there? and, you know, you guys were there as well. Yeah. What do you think? No, I'm, I mean, I think a presentation mm -hmm. at council meeting yeah. presentation. That, that utilized, um, you know, PowerPoint kind of mm -hmm. thing with some, uh, examples of the kind of thing we were talking about, even within Yellow Springs, you know, right. I mean, we, we walked down Xenia Avenue and Dayton Street and then looked at things that could happen yep. using actual the village map to sort of. Right. Okay. I mean, I would definitely assume you're thinking of having um, Matt, Lindsay, and, and Kirsten do the presentation. Yeah. They, I mean, and in fact, I think Kim wants to come too, so okay. all three want to come. Um, so then, how much time can we give them? And 
then I mean, wait. it should be a pretty decent amount. Right. Half I mean, hour? I'd, I'd say at least a half an hour, yeah. I think that would be great if we could do that. I was going to say we maybe want to look at that agenda, <laughs> the full agenda. So, I mean, it's not going to be the next meeting, that's for right. sure. Mm -hmm. um, October 2nd or 16th looks fairly open. Yeah, I think it'd be good to do it sooner than later. Um, I mean, the second at this point looks okay. I don't think, because revenue, enterprise and special revenue funds and capital really shouldn't take that long. Okay. So, um, I mean, I, why don't you check with them on both days? Yes, I will do that. Um, all right, well, that sounds great. Great. And, and the, you know, the, the one thing that we did find out in our, in our law was, you know, outsiders kind of looked mm -hmm. and came up with mm -hmm. things that we as villagers. While you were walking, they came right. up? Oh, uh -huh. no, no, they were as part of the group. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were part of the group. Okay. They, were, gotcha. they were making notes and so forth, and, and they saw some things that really would also make the other spring more walkable. Uh -huh. Although I will also say that the folks, now I was, I was on Xenia Avenue, which is a little bit different than, than Dayton Street, that the folks from NVRPC are like, you got, you know, it, they, they thought that Xenia Avenue looked great. So there was, there was a lot of positive comment too and, and feeling that, you know, it's great that we're working on doing better but that we're already doing okay. But, but that was business versus a lot more, we were in more residential. Right. Right. Where well, we saw a lot of. There's a, a big difference in the lot. Yeah, okay. I mean, it was a really. But it was a, it was a great, great. Uh, I, 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 uh, we op it opened our eyes and opened our eyes. So I thought, I thought it was excellent. Yeah, I thought we all learned a lot and we also had a great representation. You know, we had somebody from the senior center, we had Green County Public mm -hmm. Health there. Um, Chief Handicap. Carlson was there for a while, Jason. Handicap. Yep, we had... Uh, uh, Catherine, is it? Ka Catherine, yes, yeah. that was here. So, uh, yeah, so it was great. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, Patty, do you have much to report? Uh, I have about, a Talk about Pele Island. Uh, Pele <laughs> Island was quiet, and, uh, and I read books, and I walked, and <laughs> I had a bonfire on the beach, and I came back with a cold. But, uh, you know, that, that's okay. Um, I got a couple of bug bites, and, but it was, uh, it was quiet, relaxing. It was an interesting ferry ride back on Friday, because we were tilting quite a bit, and I was wondering about my car, but we made it. So um, I do have a couple of things to report. Um, I did get a, uh, an attaboy for our um, water distribution crew for the uh, water break on, I think it was on Saturday, on Shawnee Drive, there was a water main break, and um, there was a family get together going on, and uh, apparently our crew was very efficient in trying to locate it and get it done and get it cleaned up, and even took a couple of pictures for the family. Uh, the get together <laughs> took some time out to go take some pictures for the family. So um, that was an attaboy for our uh, distribution crew. Uh, you that, was my that was Chris. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, Chris is Chris. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> and uh, apparently Ben stopped what he was doing and went over and took a couple of uh, family photos for him. So. Um, I did get a text back from John Gudgel um, that the uh, mediation celebration, the 30th anniversary, is here at the Bryan Center in A and B. So, um, and then I think the other thing um, that I wanted to address was um, a little bit of clarification for an article that um, Audrey Hackett wrote in the news. Um, she mentioned that the CBE uh, infrastructure, and I know we're not calling it the CBE, but we've never come up with something other than that. Um, it mentioned that it goes throughout the entire development, and it really does not. It is the infrastructure that is going back to um, back to where Cresco potentially will locate their facility. And uh, it's the road that goes back to that, and then the water, sewer, storm, and then we'll, we'll put in the um, fiber, the conduit for the fiber. Worth giving us a couple of different ways to maybe do that. Um, it will go back there. It does not branch out into the other um, the other parcels on the lot. Judy, can you pull up that um, PDF 
that I sent you. Yeah. Um, in fact, an interesting development that happened just this morning. Um, as soon as I got in the office, Mike Heinz uh, called me and asked for a, a meeting this morning with the staff. And he had an idea of be a better way to run the infrastructure um, that actually does not take the road out to East Enon. It takes it back, turns it in. Um, it would still allow us to put in the extra sleeves every so often for additional development. But it actually makes the back part of the property a little bit more marketable um, for future development, if that's where we decide to go. And the road can be added. And I don't know how well you can see it here, but if you look, um, down here is Dayton Yellow Springs Road, and then it goes up and curves back to the cul-de-sac, which is to the south of the Cresco lot. Instead of going also out to East Enon, it develops a larger lot over here to the northeast, um, and that allows quite a bit more development in that parcel. And all of the utilities can be run for any future development that we may choose to do can run off of what will be run for Cresco. And would this engineering be enough to, to do that? Yes. So we would not have to get an additional? Well, it, you will have to have the engineering to the specific lots, uh -huh. but those will generally be done by whomever is building on that lot, uh -huh. if that's what you're asking. Me. Okay. You know, the only additional engineering that we would have would be if we added another main, if we extended the road. Um, also, this, the road has now moved a little bit to the, uh, to the west because where it was running is actually topographically the, large, the highest point, and this actually saves some construction and some earth moving and things and creates a larger lot over here for more development in the future. Makes it a over more, here. I could, I'm over. sorry, over to the east. Or closer to AUM. Co closer to AUM. So is Judy, it, can you pull it down? Is can you? I don't know if you can make it small. I, I want to see that lot that's on top. That's on. That's that's to the to the west of, or to the east of, Cresco. There you go. Okay. So it, the road was originally coming up, and where it would it would make a turn, and then it would go off onto East Enon, and that was actually cutting that lot and making it virtually useless. This way, there's a cul-de-sac here and then another cul-de-sac at the end and utilities can be looped around there and then as future development comes in that lot is easily developed that way. And has this been run by the fire department? Um, at this point it hasn't. The fire, there are fire hydrants in there every 400 feet which is the regulation. And um, I'm just thinking of access turn, turn radii. It has enough turn radii okay. for semis and uh, fire equipment. Okay. Um, and then as each lot develops, um, Chief Altman will determine if he wants additional accesses by the developer. Does this adjustment change the cost of the engineering work? No. Okay. What's, are there any downsides to making this change? <laughs> Not really, because if someone decides to buy that northeast lot in the future, they always have the opportunity to run their own access road off the backside if they choose to do that. And it actually gives us a benefit on that lot because it makes it more developable for uh, another entity. So is it is it going to be a one way that would come in either on the east or the west and no it, it's it's a it's a two-way is a two-way road and you could pull that's why the cul-de-sacs are 60 feet turning radius which is enough for a semi so both of these a semi can come in and turn around and go back out are, are you asking us to make some kind of decision or <laughs> well I, I actually told Mike that I thought this was a, a better okay. uh, a better plat you're just letting us know yeah okay. Thank you. So, hey, are there any other questions? Does would uh, Cresco still have access off of their property to Enid? No. No. Okay, so it cuts, they're okay with that. It, it cuts. They, there, it went past. Yes, we cleared it with their architect before that. Yeah, we did. Okay. And they weren't really 
planning on access for me in any way. So that really wasn't part. They, they, it would have been nice, but I, you know, they talked at one point about you know just coming in. They thought it would be easier to do the road off of Enon, right. except for the fact that the water and sewer have to come off right. of um, DYS. Right. So that didn't make any sense at all. So um, they agreed that that the access off of DYS was was best. And that's Great, all thanks. I have. Uh, Melissa. Okay, um, my report's rather long, but I'm going to try to keep my comments brief since um, anybody that's interested could read the the report in, at length. Um, a few things I am going to touch on. Um, there were some um, topics that had come up um, in the past week in regards to utilities and some of our processes. I just wanted to kind of highlight a few of those. Our check acceptance policy, um, you can find that on the village's website, village department's utility billing, and then the utility office policies and procedures. We take checks from anybody unless um, we have received a return check and then we, our policy is not to accept checks for six months after that. So um, all of that is outlined in full on the website and our policies and procedures. Um, and I do want to outline our disconnect notice process. Um, this comes straight from the ordinance. My office follows the ordinance to a T. We actually take time every couple months to sit down as a group and look at the ordinance to make sure we're not missing anything, look at it with fresh eyes. We do have two disconnect procedures. We have our normal disconnection procedure for people that um, just have not paid their bill per the ordinance, um, regular bill, and then we have a disconnection procedure for those who are on a payment agreement. A lot of people um, were curious as to why we had stopped hand delivering notices two days before disconnection. Well, that's a process for our payment agreements and not our normal disconnection. So um, I would just direct everybody to Ordinance 1040 on the Village's website as well. Um, Another uh, topic that came up with utilities was the Roundup program. And Marianne, Marianne and I have talked about this and um, where it was kind of left is we're getting this new utility billing software and it's going to take some um, adjustment from my staff to learn how to do just their normal everyday functions with a new software program that's very different from what they're used to. So I ask that that be tabled so that we do not make any changes to that system for at least six months um, after the software is up and running, which should be October at this point. So I gave some more information about that. Um, there was just reminding everybody the 2018 budget will be the next meeting. Um, peak shaving, some information in there. Um, as a result of our peak shaving, uh, the village was able to save uh, approximately $100,000 for 2018 capacity costs, um, which is good. So those notices are very important. Um, and I also included uh, our ordinance on our disconnection policies in my report. And one final thing is that Last week on Thursday, uh, there was a, a group meeting with the Ohio EPA. It was a great meeting. Um, Karen and Brian were also there. Um, myself, Johnny Burns, um, Brad Alt, some of the people from Shook, um, also from our engineering firm, um, Dayton staff, some people, some folks from Columbus EPA were there. And it was a really good meeting. Um, we talked a lot about collaboration and how the village can work with the EPA um, in terms of bringing our new water plan online, um, getting some of our older uh, pipes that are in the village flushed out to try to minimize brown water moving forward. Uh, they talked about developing a communications plan to make sure that uh, citizens and villagers are notified in a timely manner anytime there's going to be any kind of a change to the system with this new plant coming online or hydrant flushing so that if there could be any brown water, we're able to get that information out in a timely manner um, through a number of different methods. Um, so we're going to have uh, some brainstorming happen in terms of 
that communications plan, what it's going to look like, some different uh, ways to do some outreach, um, unlike what we've done in the past since this uh, new water plant is going to be such a, a great thing for the village and really trying to communicate effectively with uh, all of the villagers in terms of what that new water plant is going to do, what we were dealing with with the old water plant, and just really educate folks on our water as well. So I'm really excited. I think that there's going to be a lot of good stuff that comes from uh, that meeting that we had on Thursday. So I think that that's it for me, unless Karen or Brian have nope. anything to add on Go that. Go ahead. I would just like to thank <coughs> Melissa for, I, I, I went to some place last week where I couldn't get reception. So it, it, Melissa did a great job. There was a lot going on in the village last week. And I'm just really, really pleased and can't give her enough credit for what she did last week. So. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I just want to add, um, you know, we had seven people from Ohio EPA at that meeting. Um, and as uh, Melissa said, it was very collaborative. They want to support us. They talked about helping us <clears throat> with fact sheets. And uh, I also heard what Mariano said to you uh, <laughs> afterwards. Um, and I agree, you really did an amazing job handling that meeting. Thank you very much. And, uh, and clearly, if a, a state agency is impressed, that says something. So, and there were actually eight, Brian. Oh, there were eight, eight OEPA people. Oh, yeah, did it I was. Miss one? Yeah, okay. it was great, and they were, you know, as everybody said, they were very supportive, and we're gonna be. They're really gonna help us get through everything that is to come. Mm -hmm. And and the plant, they were incredibly impressed with the mm -hmm. plant, and we can't wait to show it off. We don't know yet when that's gonna be, but we can't wait. So, um, Judy. Just wanted to thank uh, Samantha Stewart and her crew and Jason and his guys for keeping the pool running all summer. It, it, I'm sad it's closed, but it was a great summer. Um, How did the uh, doggy thing go last night? Well, as doggy you can swing. imagine, 30 to 40 dogs and <laughs> all of their owners and a lot of water. It was really calm and uneventful. <laughs> also a horse. I was going to say. Just saying. <laughs> also <laughs> what? A horse. A horse. A horse was in the pool? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, really interesting to all the dogs. So, uh, it, you know, it was a great, calm way to spend the evening. Was there a lot of barking? <laughs> it was a, yeah, a lot of barking, but it was, people were very happy and excited, and it was just something really different and interesting, and there was a great idea that they came up with, and it went, it went great. So this and was a fundraiser, fundraiser, correct, mm -hmm. for yeah. new boards or something? New, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, it could have gone really so south, but it didn't at all. There are no dogs at the bottom of that pool, and it's good. <laughs> I hear that one of the lifeguards actually had to rescue a dog. She did. She Aww. did. She got that dog. Mm -hmm. All good. And his chew toy. <laughs> just, um, and just uh, heads up, kids are kids are riding to school in their usual disjointed and distracted fashion. Uh, and a lot of parents are using their cell phones all at the same time, so please beware. That's it. Thank you. And, Sergeant Knapp. And, and a oh. comment on that real quick, since you mentioned the kids riding bikes, the uh, local designs that we put up. The Shiro's. Shiro's has really made a difference. Okay. Motorists are actually paying attention, and mm -hmm. I haven't yeah. seen that many swinging out around. Actually, the, a couple days ago, I was riding down Xenia Avenue, you know, in the middle of the road, and I heard a honk, and I wasn't sure if it was honking at me, but I kept riding, and then I heard another honk, and then this car <coughs> passed me as close as it could, honking at me, and ran down, and I, I was so mad, I did something uh -huh. good. <laughs> but I really wish I had gotten the license for it. We have a three yeah. foot law now. Three are, you, have you caught, are you guys looking for that? What's that? The three foot law. That you have to be three oh, feet away three from feet away from the bike riders? From a cyclist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say we're actively measuring the three feet. <laughs> oh, but you can usually tell. You can tell. Mm -hmm. You can okay. tell. Okay. Um, so on, the, on the school thing, inches. Chief Carlson had put out some information to the parents about when there's dropping off their students at Mills Lawn to have their children exit on the curbside, not in the roadway, center line side of their vehicle so kids aren't darting in between cars. It's that pretty bad. Yeah. Out, that so. has to be released. It's pretty bad that that isn't just kind of yeah. common knowledge. 
Oh, well. uh, so I don't want to steal any of his thunder. I do have July's and August reports of activity, if that's what he normally does, if you want to hear that. If not, if there's any questions. He usually you just kind of summarizes. Or summarizes everything. Well, in the month of July, things of noteworthy, we had 793 calls for service. August, we had 734. Um, roughly 200 offense reports were taken individually each month and 69 and 110 citations to include warnings and parking tickets were issued respectively in the month of July and August. Uh, and we had two overdoses in uh, July with five doses of Narcan used and one in August with one dose of Narcan used. And that's the highlights of the uh, activity of the month of July and August. Great. Well, and again, I want to say I really like that uh, the community engagement is now showing up on those reports. Sure. I think that's that's nice to see. Uh, yeah, we did do. Uh, those are have been reported for. Um, I'm sorry, I have that. Oh, the uh, community engagement screen calls for service that were made in July were 25, and we did 31 in August as well. Yeah. Thanks, Sergeant. Excellent. Thank Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, September is not going to be fun. September 18th is not going to be fun. Mm -mm. Mm. Wow. It's not going to be fun. No. Have you let's looked at uh, this? Let's make this size of the agenda. I've got an additional thing. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so we did, I mean, most of these we're going to be able to read by, read, although every one of them I'm going to have to open a public hearing. Yeah. So we're going to have a little bit of time on each one of these. I mean, uh, can I suggest something? What? Does the second reading have to, well, the, re yes. the reason I want to suggest it, the JSTF has come to its first, the end of its first year of work. Um, we're going to have a report for council, and I know, um, you know, I know we need some feedback from council. So that is not a short discussion. That's not going to be a five minute report. Um, we have not been able to get much, you know, feedback from council when we brought recommendations, and I think there's a feeling that, you know, we want to, we need a time and soon where we can get input from council because we're trying to um, organize our next year's work plan, basically. I have a question. Will you yeah. be able to have I mean, a report in the packet? Yes. Pat's so already got a draft. It's very okay. good. As, I mean, um, that would make a difference. I mean, yeah. again, being presented something yes, and kind yes, of yes. responding yeah. on the fly yes. is no, not easy. No, absolutely. And maybe what we could do is it try to define if there's particular decisions that we think, I mean, if, you know. If you guys could wait till October 2nd, that would be really nice. But nope. Well, I mean, my, one of the questions I had was with all this legislation, it's a lot of it's a lot of little detailed. It's not time constrained. Can we wait with some of it to do it following meeting rather than having just a boatload of all this little detail? Well, I, I mean, I think we just need to get the pocket communities done. I, okay. I think all right. well, that's, um, it also you can't you'd have to table it all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And well, if we're going to do it October, then that would be my. Although I mean, you could really be right. Maybe this. Maybe this. What, what? Well, we've got the general fund budget, which usually takes longer. Yeah. Tap fee increase discussion and revolving loan fund discussion. I mean, we want, we need input, but we also want to let you know, I mean, we kind of, uh, in looking at Pat's draft, it made me aware that the committee has actually done a fair amount of work, and uh, we want to be able to report on that, too, so. You've also added your HNA comparative breakdown and right. resolution. Yeah. I mean, so if, if it needs to be October, that's fine, but we're going to need just, it's more than a five-minute, it's not going to be real long, like, they, we don't expect that, but. Okay, so. Say. We'll add that to October minutes, second. Maybe. So for October. Yeah. Okay. Um, an item that I mentioned last time that I guess I'd like to show up um, at some point is the uh, the Arts Council a report on the permanent collection, which will not be a long. Can we put that on the sixteenth? So, and, and we can't forget that we either, probably October 2nd, we've got a half hour, yeah. which, is, which will probably turn into longer than that, dedicated to complete streets. Mm -hmm. When is that? October 2nd, possibly October 16th, depending upon the schedule of the folks that are coming. 
I mean, I guess one question I had. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Can you give us some idea of what what to expect with the Arts Council discussion? Because clearly when that came up, the permanent collection situation a few years ago was um, a difficult discussion. I mean, are you ex what are you bringing? Well, the permanent collection is what's now housed at Antioch University Midwest. Right. So mm -hmm. I think it's pretty straightforward. So it's, it's basically just we've got a place to store the art. Um, it's going to be slow movement. Um, we've already talked about, you know, that Patty and staff will help sort of section by section think about what art would fit in those different areas. So if, if um, is it the Arts Council's permanent class? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, and so they would like to bring it back to a more logical home, um, but this will be And a where is it going to be held? Where is it going to be kept? Oh, well, the things that aren't hanging, we've got, we found a space behind the uh, stage, okay. behind the gym. Um, it's got uh, Nancy and so things uh, will kind of be moving. Yeah, they'll revolve something. things out. Um, but uh, you know, so I think basically, uh, Nancy wants to show us you know some examples of what it looks like. But you can really see it all in Antioch University Midwest right now, and um, and then just see if we're good with that. So what? So is are we going to need legislation, or is this simply a discussion? <coughs> I think it is uh, a short special report that, I mean, if we have any feedback or comments on, um, but uh, the Arts and Culture Commission has already reviewed it. Patty's already reviewed it, so. Do you, do you want to put it on for the second since we've got a kind of a hanging question about the complete st streets presentation, and then that can be maneuvered on the 18th if you need to move something at that point, just give it a placeholder of the second. Okay, let's do if that. If they're yeah. able to be a little flexible on it, Brian. Right. And also, I should mention while we're talking about it, uh, we will know tomorrow whether the revolving loan fund will be ready to come to us on the 18th. Okay. So, so that's possi a possible. Possibly may need to move. What is that? So a possible um, request for some. No, so this is our. Uh, you know, we've had a, we had a revolving loan fund in the past, and so this is reviving that loan fund um, and uh, the credit union uh, has agreed to help us with the uh, fiscal piece of reviewing um, so and we have some money that's still there okay so it looks like we're pretty full on the 18th and pretty full on the getting full on the second so um, in the 16th so um, entertain a motion to adjourn so move. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.